Okay, I think it's time to start now. We're already one minute late. Okay, so we're going to continue the computation and memory or in memory computation uh, lecture today. Let's see if we can finish it today. Hopefully we can, but it's not a big deal if we cannot also. So feel free to ask questions. This is a fascinating area, and this is an area where there's a lot of activity today, uh, as I motivated last time. And I believe something big will hopefully come up in computation and memory in the coming years, uh, so that we can change the paradigm that has been dominant for more than 70 years, which is, processor, which is the processor-centric paradigm. Okay, uh, so we're going to have some fun in this lecture also, talking about that mindset change, because whenever you want to change the mindset, it's not easy. Uh, in the end, uh, you're really dealing with uh, mindsets that are relatively fixed, especially if something has been around for decades and decades. It's not easy to change it because all of the infrastructure has been built for it. People have been doing things that way for decades and decades. And people are not willing to change in general. And the inertia is much higher uh, to change. So the question is how do you actually overcome that inertia? Okay, but before that, uh, let's talk about, uh, let's, let's start off uh, where we left off last time. Remember, we motivated intelligent memory controllers, both from the bottom up, from the push from circuits and devices, and you've been reading some papers related to it. Uh, and we motivated from top down also the need from the systems, applications, and the demands that we have from the from our lives, if you will, like sustainability and efficiency, right? If you, if you put those at the top, then you have a very different way of thinking about computing, right? Performance is important, yes, but you should, performance should not come at all costs, like extreme energy uh, consumption. And then we talked about the one way of uh, thinking differently about processing in memory, uh, which is minimally changing memory chips. We're going, to, we're going to pick up on this one. If you recall, we were talking about how to minimally change memory chips to do some simple acceleration operations. And we talked about the row clone paper. Do you remember this one? Okay. This is a way of copying and initialization, uh, doing initialization of data inside the memory without involving anything else uh, in the system or without moving data uh, through any other place in the system, just moving data within uh, the memory chip. Uh, but of course, this sort of approach doesn't work if, you're, if you want to move data between two memory chips. right? If your memory chip is here, and if you want to move data, uh, copy data to some other memory chip, how are you going to move? Uh, how are you go going to do that movement? You have to go through some external interface, right? So you have to at least go through memory controller, uh, and the memory controller orchestrates the data movement between the two memory chips. So this works when you actually have the data uh, source and destination in the same memory chip for copying, and we also saw that. Uh, this idea works much better if the source and destination are in the same subway in DRAM, where the rows actually share the sense amplifiers, right? So keep in mind, the, 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 long, the farther you want to move the data, the more energy you waste, and the performance impact is also larger. That's also very fundamental whenever you're doing data movement. So if you have multiple memory chips, and if you want to move data between them, then you need to really seek other solutions, right? If you really want to get rid of data movement, maybe at the higher levels of the stack, <coughs> You should try to ensure that whenever you're moving data or copying data, you restrict it to be in the same memory chip. So how can you do that? Perhaps you can change your operating system, right? Such that uh, you, min you try to minimize the copies across different memory chips. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or perhaps you change the application software. Although application software usually doesn't have control over where its data is mapped because we have these interfaces. But that may be something to the rethink also, right? If the application software has knowledge of uh, what data will be copied where and when, it may actually provide a hint to the underlying layers. Uh, this doesn't exist yet today, but this may be useful in the future. It may provide a hint to the underlying layers saying that keep this destination local because I'm going to do something to it, for example, right? Okay. Any thoughts on this? Okay. I mean, another alternative actually uh, is not having separate memory chips, right? Basically somehow having all of your memory in a single chip. And we kind of alluded to it uh, last time we talked, right? Remember the 3D stacking of flash memory? If you can stack main memory that way also, maybe you could keep stacking like a skyscraper. And, and then you, you have these layers that have uh, memory inside them. And you have th hundreds of or thousands of layers. 
And these layers will be connected with each other with some interconnect. Hopefully not as heavy interconnects as what we have today when we go off chip. And we will see in 3D stack memory those are not very heavy interconnects. And then you, you actually stay in the same chip across different layers. But of course the problem is very fundamental, right? If you want to move data from layer 1 to layer 1000, you still need to go through something, some interconnect. And even, if, even though those interconnects may be short and small, you're traversing them a thousand times. Right? So keep that in mind. So it's very hard to overcome the data moment problem. Ideally, you would like to eliminate the data moment as much as possible or keep things local to, uh, to each other as, as much as possible. So it's good to think about what are the what other creative solutions that exist to this problem, right? <laughs> I like 3D stacking a lot, but if, if we push it to the limits, even, even, even if we don't have thermal issues, because a thousand layers will also create thermal issues, right? Even if we don't have thermal issues, you, uh, you still need to find some other solutions to keep the data local. Because moving across so many stacks or so many layers will still cause data movement. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, maybe if you're talking about intelligent memory controls, controllers, you could take some ideas from the operating systems in a way mm -hmm. that the OS knows the ID of every process, mm -hmm. and maybe if that ID could be in a way told uh, to the memory controller, mm -hmm. it could maybe know that, okay, this process ID requires more memory, maybe I should put it near the other the other memory this process ID mm -hmm. already, already allocated, mm -hmm. which could essentially prove useful for when the process actually requires some memory cloning operations. Uh, for, for what operations? Memory cloning operations, so... Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, that could be a, hi a hint also, certainly. We will see later on in the lectures that having process IDs or, or thread IDs okay. in, in some way communicate to the memory control is a good idea to provide quality of service yeah. to different applications. Yeah, yeah but certainly communicate, today, today that information is not communicated well into the memory controller. The memory controller usually doesn't know which application requests are coming from as we discussed yeah. early on, right? But having that information could help memory allocation also. Right? It's a good idea. Yes? Pipeline the memory. So what does that mean exactly? Like if the if fetching something in a memory takes fifty cycles, can't we do like fifty uh, checks checkpoints? I see. Uh -huh. and, <laughs> and then uh, so it takes time, but we don't care because we will hmm. we have one uh, result every cycle. I see. Uh, so th that's a good point. It's 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 uh, the latencies are so long that it's it's a bit harder to do it. So, in a sense, subarrays are the small structure, and they take some time. The rest can be pipelined, but whenever you access a row, for example, the activation of that row takes such a long time that it's, it's hard to pipeline it. Does that make sense? <laughs> I like your thinking. And also, I think it's good to think about uh, what would you do once you pipeline it. Assume that you pipeline it perfectly. I think the benefit would be really, we will later actually see a mechanism that kind of does pipelining across different subarrays, uh, and that reduces, that overlaps the latencies of multiple requests. So maybe we'll see that uh, in action to, uh, tomorrow, or when we talk about latency. But that's a good idea in general, that overlaps the latency. But that doesn't fundamentally get rid of the data movement rate. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good thoughts. Any others? Okay, so let's keep going. So if you also remember, we looked at this slide, and I, I want to show this slide again, because this is something that's really needed in any sort of processing in memory. Uh, basically, you have some substrate that can do some operation uh, in memory, like cloning a row or initializing a row. You really need to communicate this information all the way from the higher levels of the stack. Right? Application needs to be able to specify the copy or initialization operations, and we discussed this, so I'm not going to go through this in general, so, which means that you need some modifications over here. Or alternatively, somehow, uh, so maybe there's a compiler step over here, compiler somehow figures out these operations and compiles them to, into special instructions that do the copying and initialization inside memory, right? So if you don't want to bother the programmer, you, you may actually do this transparently to the programmer at the compiler level. It may not be very easy to do, of course, because application may not be written. Uh, to do very large chunks of copies. If the, if the programmer is thinking, okay, these large chunks of copies are extremely efficient uh, inside memory, they may actually rewrite the application a different way. Right? 
we actually discussed people actually rewrite the applications so that they get rid of the copies. But if you know that copies are also extremely cheap, maybe you actually try to maximize the large copies uh, that you have in an application. That's also possible. Uh, how do you ensure cache coherence? We're going to talk about that hopefully toward the end of this lecture a little bit. Uh, not so much detail, but you, you may read some papers. Uh, and this is important. Whenever you're modifying data in one place and somebody else also may modify data in some other place, you have the cache coherence problem. It's very fundamental. And we're going to talk about that also. There's a lot of uh, uh, real issues associated with this, both in terms of uh, theory uh, as well as uh, practice. Okay, how do you maximize latest energy savings? And we talked about that. We actually were talking about that just now. Uh, and how do you handle the data reuse? This is something that's also important. And this really, all of this really cuts across the stack. And you could actually answer a lot of these questions at different levels, perhaps, right? For example, you could say cache coherence is not my problem as a hardware designer. You could say the programmer should worry about that. But then you, you push a big burden to the programmer. Now the programmer needs to ensure that the application, uh, whenever they're offloading something to memory, the copy, for example, the copy operation, uh, no, no data that they're going to uh, overwrite in memory is in the caches. Right? So that's not good for the programmer. And usually in, uh, uh, when people try to offload, if you will, or put the burden of cache querents to the programmer, those products were not very successful. <laughs> because programmers have a lot of things that they need to deal with anyway. They first need to get the programs correct. right? That's not easy to begin with. And remember, we're talking about most of the programmers of the world. There's a fraction of programmers that are really good, of course. They can do anything. But you're not really catering to the, that small fraction. You're really catering to a huge chunk of the software world. And if you tell them you need to deal with cache coherence on top of everything else you need to deal with, they don't even get the programs correct to begin with, right? So it's going to be very difficult. So keep this in mind. Whenever you want to change the paradigm in a different way, you cannot say, oh, it's not my problem. <laughs> it is really your problem. All of these problems that are caused uh, by the shift of the paradigm to a different model, uh, you, you really need to think about them and solve them. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Okay, so remember, this was the thinking, basically. You want memory as an accelerator, uh, and uh, we put specialized uh, cloning or copying or initialization capability over here. Now the question is, what else can you put over there? Right? In a sense, this is, I don't want to call it cheating. I think this is a very good idea, actually. Cloning and uh, copying and initialization is used in many workloads. But it's really not computation, right? You're not computing here, you're just moving data or initializing data. So the question is, can you do something that can do computation inside the memory? Without, of course, with minimally changing memory chips. Without putting a full processor over there. You could certainly put a full processor over there, right? Which may not be feasible. The area will be very high, very large. And we discussed that. People have looked at that over decades and decades. And it has not been as successful. Uh, the question is, what else can you do? Any guesses? Any thoughts? Anybody has brilliant ideas? Yes? Something simple like shift or stuff like that could be maybe implemented easily into the already existing rows. Okay. Which could, in small increments, increase the computational ability of the memory. Okay. Yeah, shifts could be. Maybe good to think about it, go to the next level and think how shift is implemented exactly. But I agree, I think shift is something that could be useful. And that's going to be lacking in what I, what I described. <laughs> but I, there's no question that it, it could be useful if you do it uh, over there. Yeah, yeah, totally. But in a sense, it seems like a simple operation yeah. to do on a row basis, which means with minimal changes. That's right. Depends on how, I think depends on how, uh, uh, by how much are you going to shift the row. Oh, okay. If you shift it by one bit, it's relatively simple. Yeah. If you start shifting by arbitrary amounts, now your interconnect complexity increases, right? Because you're taking, let's say, let's say you're taking it on a row, row level, 8 kilobytes. Uh, you're really shifting 8 kilobytes at a time. If you're shifting it by, let's say, 10, mm -hmm. you really need to support all of those muxes that require uh, you to put any bit in any position, in a sense, right? Yeah. So uh, simple shifts are easy, but complex shifts may not be as easy. But it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good idea. I'm not dismissing it. But there may be simpler ways of implementing it. Maybe, maybe you don't do it at the row level. Yes? Maybe some big 
Okay? How would you do it? Okay. Maybe or something in the logic layer. Okay. Okay. Yeah, certainly. I think bitwise operation is a good idea. I'm going to talk about a simple way of implementing it without adding a logic layer or without adding any logic units, actually. But simple operations like that, simple ALUs, are po potentially possible to add also uh, inside a DRAM chip. Yes? That's yeah. In, in the, at least in the current programming paradigms, you're right. In the current programming paradigms, we usually don't do shifts in a row level. We usually do it in an integer, for example, level. So maybe implementing integer level shifts may not be that bad, right? Yeah, yeah I agree. <laughs> But keep thinking out of the box also. Maybe role level operations could be good also, right? If you, if you have a lot of data. Okay. So if you have any other ideas, let me know after I discuss this one. So let's talk about this one. Basically, I've given you this NDM copy zeroing. I'm going to show you how you can do and or not bitwise at the role level uh, with very little additional logic, meaning at low cost. Remember, we want to minimally change the DRAM. We don't want to change it significantly in this particular approach. And it's always good to think about this, uh, think, think about it this way. What can you do minimally and hopefully get a lot of benefit out of it? And we're also going to look at what can we do maximally later on. Whenever you're trying to change the paradigm, it's good to think both ways. And also it's good to think intermediate levels. I think we've been doing some of that thinking over here uh, right now. Okay, basically the key idea is this. We want to use the analog computation capability of DRAM. Actually, analog computation capability exists in many memory chips. I will briefly talk about that over this part of the slide. Uh, actually, we did exploit the analog chart sharing capability for moving data in row clone, right? You're really chart sharing the chart. If you remember the animations that I showed you, whenever you activate a row, charge gets shared between the cell and the bit line, and the sense amplifier senses that and amplifies it. And then, whenever you activate the next row, that charge gets shared into the capacitor. That's all analog. There's nothing digital over here. Sense amplifier is the only place where things are digital in a sense, right? It really amplifies things to one and zero, or highest voltage and lowest voltage. So everything we discussed in row clone was analog. Now, it turns out, if you activate multiple rows at the same time, this also performs computation. Now you can start thinking why at this point, but it's really about chart sharing again. And I'm going to give you uh, exactly how it works, but it turns out this actually leads to 30 to 60x performance energy improvement in these bitwise operations. And this is the paper uh, that introduces this concept. It's done by one of my PhD students whose thesis was about uh, computation and memory. But before we go into it, um, this is actually very fundamental. I think new memory technologies have this analog computation capability as well, internally. Uh, we may see that later on. Memory stores, resistive RAM, phase change memory, uh, or STTM RAM, these different technologies, they all have capability to do analog, some sort of analog computation. This is also called resistive computation. We actually be, uh, operate based on different resistances and uh, uh, they, they operate in similar, using similar principles. You can, for example, do matrix operations uh, if you have an array of uh, resistive memory. And I think there's another benefit to these technologies. You can operate on data with minimal movement. Why in DRAM, whenever you actually share charge, what happens is that you really, uh, um, in a sense, you destroy the row, right? You activate the row, you actually share the charge, and that, uh, you, this will become more, more apparent in the next slide, but that row actually just gets destroyed and the sense amplifier replenishes the charge. But if you actually change the value in that row, you're not able to reconstruct what you had earlier because you lost what you have earlier. This will become more clear. But in new memory techno these, these, these new technologies, in, in these new technologies, reads are not really destructive. As a result, you can actually do very close to minimal data movement in them. Okay, if it's not clear, th don't worry about it. We'll hopefully have a lecture that talks about these technologies later on. But let's take a look at how you can do it in DRAM. So the idea is very simple. 
uh, it's to do a triple row activation. I mean, that's what it says basically. Assume that these are three rows. Again, I'm not showing the eight kilobyte row over here or four kilobyte, whatever it is. I'm showing one bit and a single bit line. Basically, assume that you had the primitive and the hardware support to do three activations at the same time. Activate all of these three rows at the same time. Now what happens? Assume again an ideal circuit. In ideal circuit theory, uh, what you should get is uh, 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 the, uh, the majority of these three bits. Now what, why? So if at least two of these cells are charged, uh, you would get uh, the charge state at the end. If at least two of these cells are discharged, you would get the discharge state at the end. Why? Because the perturbations that are caused by uh, the majority of the cells will drive the sense amplifier toward the direction of the majority uh, function. So let's take a look at this example. So these two cells are charged. We activate all three rows at the same time. All of the three rows share charge. And what happens is you get a positive perturbation over here because you have two of these cells are charged, right? It's, again, assume ideal circuits. If there are process radiations, this may become more difficult, but ignore that for now. Basically, what, what we've done is, uh, the charge sharing, based on charge sharing principles, the bit line senses the majority value that you have in these three cells. That's the idea. And once it senses the majority, it basically, the sense amplifier starts amplifying because it detects that perturbation, and this becomes high voltage, and sense amplifier fills everything. So basically all of the cells now got the value that was in the majority of the three cells. Make sense? Okay. You can do the other way around with uh, at least two cells discharged also, then you would get VDD minus over here and then uh, you would get zero over here. Okay, so basically the final state after you do triple row activation is a majority function. That's what the majority function is in Boolean, right? Which means now, which implies that you can do a bitwise majority function across a row. I think this is very powerful actually. A bitwise majority is a very interesting function. People developed logic theory based on majority functions. There's actually work going on at EPFL uh, by Nani de Michele's group that looks at how do you do logic synthesis using majority functions, bitwise majority functions. Uh, and they actually propose some logic mechanisms, uh, not necessarily memory mechanisms like this. Uh, to do a majority very fast. Uh, and also Donald Knuth. How many of you know the name Donald Knuth? Okay, good. <laughs> you should read the, uh, the, the book series that he has, right? Uh, the Art of Computer Programming. <laughs> uh, but basically he has an extra book. Uh, in, 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 in that extra book he talks about the importance of the majority function also. Uh, from a very interesting theoretical and practical perspective. I'm not going to talk about that. But this means that you can do a majority function across one row. Assume that all of your subarrays can do this. Let's assume that you have a thousand subarrays in a DRAM chip. A thousand subarrays and each subarray has eight kilobytes. Now you can do this majority function across eight million bits. So it's actually very powerful if you want to compute the majority of many rows at the same time. But of course, majority is not only what we do. And, and now actually you can think about how do I convert my existing programs to majority functions, right? That's exactly what those folks did with, with logic synthesis. They converted existing logic synthesis tools to majority functions and they found out that you could do this very, very fast that way. But there, the second realization is that you can rewrite this Boolean equation, right? All of you know Boolean algebra. Uh, you can basically take out C over here. If C is set to one, if you program this to be 1, then you get the OR of A and B. If C is set to 0, then you get the AND of A and B. Now it's becoming more powerful. Right? You can set C to 1 and do an OR operation. You can set C to 0, do an OR uh, AND operation. That's the idea. Basically now we have a bitwise AND and bitwise OR operation across many cells in DRAM at the same time. Okay? So now the next question. Yes, please. But what if you have four rows? Two R0s and two R1s. What would be the charge? Yeah, so that's why we don't have two four rows here. <laughs> exactly. So basically, I think what you're getting at is can you generalize this to more rows? Yes, exactly. You can generalize it. But you, you will get a different equation, of course, right? That's why this is triple row activation. <laughs> because that gives you a nice majority function. So if you get five rows, you can still get majority, right? Over there. But it's a different kind of majority. It's a, the majority across five rows. <laughs> Yes. 
Yes? Rows have more than one bit? Uh, more than one bit, yes. You have more bit lines over here, yes. So you can do, let's say, eight kilobytes in a single row. Yeah. Remember the picture of the bank that had uh, many, many uh, bits. Okay, so of course, uh, I mean, there are many details, and I think I will assign this paper uh, or the other paper uh, that follows up this one uh, to you so that you can read it. Clearly, there are many interesting details as to how to make it work, right? You need to be cost conscious, for example. Uh, you cannot be doing this in all of the rows in DM arbitrarily. Why? Because then you need three decoders completely in DRAM, right? If you really want to have, uh, uh, let's assume a subarray is a thousand rows. And if you want to have the capability to do arbitrary triple row activation in any three rows, you really need three full decoders. One to decode the address A, the other to decode B, and the other to decode C. That's a lot of hardware cost. Today there's only one decoder, you activate one row, right? So you don't want that. Uh, so what we do is actually, in this work, we designate an area in the subway where you can do this activation only on those three rows. And if you want to do a triple row activation in a row, you need to first copy that row to that designated area using the row clone primitives. Make sense? Yes, you have. Yeah. Now you're telling that it will be copied to something. Yeah, special area, yes. Yeah, there, there are a lot of practical concerns. If you have the special area, it's also, uh, you can control that more easily. You can control the process variation more easily in that area. Yeah. I'm not going to go into a lot of those details, but there are clearly uh, implementation issues that you need to deal with to make it work uh, in a good way. So you really need to change the DRAM chip if you really want to make it work in a reliable uh, and consistent way. But we will later see, I will talk about a paper very briefly that does, does this uh, on a real chip, but we won't go into detail right now. Okay, so now we have AND and OR. Uh, you can actually expose this to the ISA. This is one way of exposing it, right? You could, for example, add a bulk AND instruction in your ISA. We are architects we can create, right? Uh, and the semantics could be defined as perform a bitwise AND of two rows, A and B, and store the result in row C. If you want to make this independent of the row size, you could arbitrarily define an instruction, and then that instruction gets broken up by the microarchitecture into row size operations, right? That's certainly possible also. So this instruction doesn't exist today, but if, uh, th this is one implementation of the instruction. Basically, I mentioned that there are designated rows for triple activation, and these rows don't require a, a complicated decoder, right? Basically, if you want to do triple row activation, you send a signal that activates all of those three rows at the same time. There's no decoding involved other than the fact that this is a separate signal. And uh, we have a reserved zero row and reserved one row so that we can control the end uh, uh, and or, or, or operation. So how does this work? Basically, you first row clone row A into one of the designated rows, and then you row clone row B into one of the other designated rows. And then you row clone R0, which is reserved 0 row, because we're doing an AND operation into C. If you want to do an AND operation, you need to set C to 0. And then you do the triple row activation, send that signal that activates three rows at the same time. Now you have the result in all of these three rows, right? D1, D2, D3, if you remember the picture. And you row clone the result into C uh, in the array. That's the idea. So ideally, these operations are in the same subarray. That actually maximizes your efficiency and minimizes the data movement again. Right. If, if they're in different subarrays, now you need to add computation units, right? We didn't talk about those cases. Okay? So your data mapping needs to be nice if you really want to take advantage of a substrate like this. That's why your application needs to be rewritten to take advantage of this sort of substrate. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so let's move on. So if you're, this is the original paper, this is a short paper that introduced the idea. But then the question is, uh, and, and and or are good, majority is good, all of those are good, but this is not complete. Right? It's, or it's not Boolean complete or functionally complete. If you want to be Boolean complete, you need an and operation or an or operation, or an and and not operation, or an or and not operation, right? It turns out an and and or are, I think, difficult to do in DRAM. Although there are proposals that look at that as well. Uh, but adding a not operation is not that terrible. 
And the idea is very simple, basically. Uh, in, the, in the sense amplifier, uh, you actually already have the complement of a row, right? Whenever you actually activate a row, ignore this dual contact cell for now, but whenever you activate a row, the value of the cell becomes the same as the value in the bit line, right? Because you do the chart sharing and sense amplifier uh, sets the bit line to the same value as the value of the cell. But sense amplifier is really a cross-coupled inverter, which means that to keep the value and to keep the drive, the complement of the value is over here in the bit line bar. Which means that you already have the complement somewhere in the DRAM cell, uh, somewhere in the DRAM structure. Unfortunately, this bit line bar, the complement, is not really connected to anywhere. Actually, it's connected to somewhere, but you don't need to know exactly where it's connected to right now. But it's not connected to the subray over here. Basically, the idea over here is to take that value and put it back into the subray. That's the idea. You already have the complement of a row whenever you activate a row. Why don't we take that back and put it into a special row so that uh, we can actually capture that value. Now, of course, the special row requires additional circuitry. Uh, and you're, you're going to read the paper, so you're going to see exactly how it operates. And that, uh, that leads to additional cost. So it's not as cheap as what I just described over here, triple row activation. Clearly, this is not triple row activation, right? This is really activation of a single row and uh, taking the value of the bitline bar and feeding, feeding it back uh, into another row. And this is how it operates. Uh, basically, you, you, you have this uh, dual contact cell or dual contact capacitor which can actually get the value from here or here, as you can see. So it's, it has a special connection to the sense amplifier. And let's assume that this is your source row. You first activate the source row. And after activation, you get VDD over here. And the sense amplifier over here is also enabled. Now, uh, you basically activate uh, this particular uh, transistor over here, which essentially enables the complement of this row to go and get captured in this particular cell. That's the idea. Basically, you want to create a path from this part of the sense amplifier into some other row, and that's exactly how it's created over here. Which means that it's additional cost over here. Make sense? This way, after you activate this row, and after you activate this dual contact part of this row, you will get the uh, negated value of this row, or this cell, inside this destination cell. So it's really two consecutive activates again. You activate the source row and you activate the destination in a special way. And by doing these two consecutive activates, you're not copying this value over here, but you're copying the value that's on the other side of the sense amplifier. It's very similar to row clone in that sense. Right? Except you're getting the negated value. Make sense? So it's two consecutive activates. Okay. So let's take a look at the performance implications of this. Now this uh, graph is a bit uh, crowded in a sense, but these are uh, the throughput that you have in terms of giga operations per second on some real processors. This is measured. Uh, and on a 3D stacked high, uh, memory system, which we will later talk about, you have a logic layer underneath memory layers, and the logic layer is connected high bandwidth and low latency to the memory layers. Uh, and th that, uh, that way you can do the bitwise operation inside the logic layer with logic uh, uh, added. So that's already pretty good, right? So if you look at these white bars compared to existing systems, this is a GPU, maybe not state-of-the-art, but it's very costly also. Uh, this is a CPU. And they're, they're relatively small uh, in terms of the uh, bitwise operations, although state-of-the-art GPUs actually get closer because their bandwidth is higher. And if you do these operations in the logic layer, you get actually significant throughput improvement. If you do it inside the DRAM chip, that's what this ambit means, uh, then you get even more significant throughput improvement, as you can see over here. This is, these are different operations, not and, or, and, nor, dot, dot, dot. But uh, there's no reason why you cannot combine uh, the 3D stacking and uh, a memory chip. It turns out 3D stack chips uh, really enable many, many subarrays. There are much more subarrays uh, in 3D stack chips. And that enables much higher uh, throughput uh, in this AMBIT 3D. Make sense? OK, so you can, you can see uh, these large numbers. Uh, what about energy? So if you do this, uh, bit, these bitwise operations in the memory controller, if you actually move the data to the memory controller uh, in some state-of-the-art chips at that time, you basically consume a lot of energy. 
uh, ambit actually reduces energy significantly. You can see that for not you reduce energy by almost 60x, and or is about 44x. Now you start combining operations, of course, then you uh, reduce the energy uh, reduction. Right? XOR, XNOR is more complicated, clearly, but you still get 25x energy reduction with XOR and XNOR. So the way uh, XOR and XNOR is done is by a, com by a combination of AND, OR, and NOT operations in this case. But certainly maybe there's a way to do XOR and XNOR uh, within the circuit itself, although it's very difficult. In general, XOR and XNOR are difficult functions uh, to implement. Some memory technologies, like resistor memory, enable implementation of NOR operations directly. So it's, it may be difficult to do majority functions there, but NOR operations are easier to do because of the way resistor memory operates. And there, there are a lot of interesting works that talk about how to do computing just using NOR operations. Because NOR is also functionally complete, right? It's Boolean complete. You can basically convert any program or any circuit to NORs, right? Any circuit means any program in the end. You can, you can express any program in terms of any circuit, right? Okay. Okay. So this is the summary. I already gave you these results. So I think the results are actually quite large, and this is not even optimized, in my opinion. Now the next question is, of course, who cares about this? Right? Like you have these huge bulk bitwise operations, but do you care? Any thoughts? Maybe somebody has a really interesting. Well, I think we should care if the performance is this mm -hmm. uh, this much better, and maybe something like this could actually reduce the change in the paradigm that it produces. Okay. Uh, I'm a bit confused uh, by trying not to burden the programmer with, uh, with mm -hmm. this. I mean, if this really improves the performance and the energy consumption is reduced with it, it that much, maybe the programmers should be able to actually specifically note that, okay, I want this to be done in this way, I want my memory mm -hmm. to be stored here, and I want to focus on using this, this actually, these mm -hmm. instructions which are actually going to be performed in memory. Yeah. Because, uh, again, we can do that maybe on the compiler level or the operating level, but it's never going to be completely done unless the program actually chooses. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I agree. I think, but, and there will be programmers who do that, right? For example, uh, GPUs were around for a long time, and uh, uh, programmers who really needed the performance were the first ones to actually port their general purpose applications to GPUs. We will have lectures on GPUs, and you will see that. Initially, those programmers that really want high performance and high energy efficiency are the ones who will really do it first. But I think if you want to get it to, out to the masses, maybe it's not going to be that easy. <laughs> well, yeah, but you can't get the high performance of the masses from the start. Exactly. Yeah. Yes? No, also, your effort will be wasted if you use external library, which needs to access the other part of the memory. So you, even if you uh, focus on using this operation, when you access other uh, library, you still do these data transfer. So, mm -hmm. and often I think the, the access to the external li library is more time consuming than mm -hmm. doing these operations. So mm -hmm. perhaps it's a better idea to rely on the, the compiler to, to do the, mm -hmm. this optimization. Yeah, certainly. I mean, your libraries could also be optimized, and maybe you have a good stack that uh, has a good library. Right? <laughs> I would argue that if you don't have a good library, I agree with you. But if you have a good library that's really lean yeah. and clean, you set it up early on, and while the program is running, you just do function calls. It's just like another function call, then it should be fine, I think. But I agree with you. I mean, there are overheads associated with the other parts of the software stack, right, if, if, you, if you go through indirection. Okay. So, okay, well, the next question is, I guess, what kind of applications can take advantage of this? Yes. Image processing, maybe. Okay. Yeah, image processing. You can you can convert all of those image operations to bitwise operations. Potentially. <laughs> Sometimes you operate on pixels that are bigger than bits, right? But you could be able to do some things, right? I think you will need to rethink the application a little bit if you want to do image processing. But I agree. I mean that that sort of parallelism exists in image processing, right? You could have a huge video frame. You could operate on it in parallel. At all of the video frame can be operated in parallel, right? And maybe multiple video frames can be operated in parallel at the same time, and you're in a single memory chip this way. What else? Yes? Some matrix operations for machine learning, potentially. Okay, yeah, I, I agree. Again, you may need to rethink the application a little bit. 
Because now you have and or not, and you really need to map everything to and or not trait. But it comes back to the thing that, <laughs> like, that thing is versus actually everything. Yeah. It could be, yeah. Yeah, yeah I agree. And there are papers that were written actually building on this one. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, the, this is a really good fit for operations that use a single bit, right? And operate on bits independently. So there, there are some networks called binarized neural networks, for example, binary neural networks. They're not uh, as good as uh, neural networks that operate on 8-bit values today, because 8-bit value clearly provides you more information than a single bit, for example. But people are actually looking at how to uh, take advantage of these binarized networks and increase their accuracy as much as possible. That's a great fit for this one, because they, every sample is a single bit in that case, 1 or 0, and you're operating on all of the samples independently. And that, that fits perfectly. If you're operating on any granularity that's larger than a single bit, you really need to rethink your algorithms a little bit. It's possible, actually, because people actually uh, have, uh, uh, are doing some of uh, these neural network operations in a bit serially manner. As opposed to, for example, doing uh, a multiplication. Let's say you have an 8-bit value. As opposed to multiplying that 8-bit value with another 8-bit value, uh, all of the bits at the same time, they're doing the multiplication, or let's start with addition. Let's say you want to add an 8-bit value to another 8-bit value. You can add all of those bits in parallel, right? Now that, that requires you to have an adder that's large. Or you could add all of those bits serially. You could start with bit 0 of each value and do this single bit addition, generate a sum and generate a carry. And you feed that to the next bit. Right? So you could actually do that addition serially. That's called a bit serial adder. Maybe I'll... Have you, have you guys seen this before? Bit serial and uh, bit parallel? I see some faces that uh, basically I like showing it like this. So you have an adder. Let's say you have uh, a 4 bit value like this. You can design an adder basically that takes one bit uh, at a time. I'm not going to show this basically. You have the sum and you have the carry out. Right? Uh, and what you do is basically uh, you keep storing the sum over here and then you feed, feed the carry out back into the adder. So every cycle you get one bit of A, like A0 comes in and then B0 comes in. Uh, initially, uh, I guess there is no carry in, right? Initially 0 comes in. Uh, and you get a sum, which is sum 0, in the, in the, at the end of the first cycle. And you get carry 0 at the end of the first cycle, right? So this is a single bit adder. And then if you want to add the next bit over here, in the next cycle you fit in, feed in A1, and then B1, and then carry out from 0 uh, comes in that cycle, and then you do the addition in the next cycle, and then you capture sum 1, right? And then you generate another carry, carry 1. And the next cycle, you get A2, B2, and carry 1 from here, and then you do the addition. So basically, you add one bit every single cycle, and this could work out that way, assuming you express those additions using AND or NOT, right? That's the idea. And this is clearly much simpler than building a 4-bit adder, right? If you want to build a 4-bit adder, then you need to operate all of the bits in parallel. Right? So 0, this is A0, uh, that's also B0, and then you have sum 0, I should not do that, I should probably put sum 0 over here, and then your carry goes here. Basically, this is a ripple carry adder. And clearly this is a lot more hardware. And this is carry out is lost, right? This is how you add four bits at the same time. This is how you add four bits. This is how you add four bits concurrently in space. Four bit addition in space, right? Basically, you have four units. Whereas here, you're doing the four bit add addition in time. Meaning, every single bit is added every cycle, right? Does that make sense? And a lot of the machine learning works actually today, you look at this, this bit serial. Why? Because you really want to adapt. Uh, first of all, uh, your precision is very important in terms of your efficiency. 
uh, people figured out quickly that if you want to, if you if you use large values, you get accuracy, but you don't get that much accuracy. For example, you can quantize a sample from 32 bits to 8 bits, and you really don't lose much accuracy. You might as well do the 8-bit additions all the time, right, as opposed to doing 32 bits. But people also find out you sometimes want this accuracy to be variable. Meaning that sometimes you want 4 bits, sometimes you want 2 bits, sometimes you want 8 bits. Because sometimes, uh, like when you're running low on energy, and if you want to do inference on something like this, you may not want to use 8-bit additions all the time, right? Because you're doing those additions a lot. Those are costly in terms of power. You may want to scale down to 2 bits, let's say. Now if you want to scale down to 2 bits, this is a much better substrate, right? Because this can give you 1 bit per cycle, and it can decide how many cycles you take. If you want to use only one bit, you take one cycle. If you want to do an addition with two bits, you take two cycles. If you want three bits, you get three cycles, right? It's very configurable in that sense. Whereas this one is not so configurable, right? You design an adder that's four bits, and that's it. Clearly, you can add configurability to this also, but you need to turn off parts of it. And that requires additional logic to turn off, and additional control logic to actually decide when to turn off and what to turn off, right? So it turns out this is actually a very nice substrate. This is bit serial addition. It's clearly not a new idea. But it's kind of, it's, it's getting more uh, importance today uh, with these machine learning workloads uh, that do a lot of additions or a lot of uh, computation on bits because of this flexible granularity that you want. And also, there's another principle over here. Uh, here, you're using a single for, uh, adder uh, for a single addition, right? Here, uh, basically, here you're getting, you're getting four, four bits per cycle. Here, you're getting one bit per cycle. You may argue that this is higher throughput, and that's absolutely true, right? But this is also lower latency because you're getting four bits. Uh, you're getting a four bit sum every cycle. Here, you're getting one bit sum every cycle. But what you can do over here is, if you want to match the throughput, you can have multiple of these bit serial adders, right? They're completely independent. You don't connect them to each other. But you use them for different samples, right? So you, have, you may have C over here. You may add C and D together. You may add X and Y together. And you may have, you can, you can add O and P together, right? Now you're still doing four additions per cycle. But they're completely independent additions. And you still have the flexibility to do two bits on each of them, or one bit on each of them, or four bits on each of them, by configuring how many cycles uh, you take for each of the samples. Does that make sense? So that's the beauty of bit serial computing. Uh, in a sense, AMBIT is an example of this sort of bit serial computing. You really operate on a single bit at a time. If you want to actually do something else with that bit, you do another ambit operation. Right. That's the idea. But this is actually a, a, not, a, not a new idea. This is a fundamental thing in parallel processing. The first machine that really talked about the sort of bit serial computing was this connection machine. Uh, this was actually designed in uh, early, uh, late, uh, late 1980s. Uh, and what they, what they did was they actually figured out that in the tasks that they want to do, a lot of linear algebra operations, for example, uh, there's a lot of parallelism in the tasks, uh, which meaning that they operate on a lot of data. Uh, so they, they really care about throughput, but they don't care about the latency of each operation. So you really don't want an adder that looks like this, because this actually minimizes the latency of a single addition. If you don't care about the latency of a single addition, go to a bit serial adder, you do many additions at the same time still, so you have the same throughput. But it's a much simpler logic because you, ha you, you really don't, uh, you have really separate adders over here. Make sense? I believe that machine in early 1990s, for example, had 64,000 or 64K uh, bit serial computation elements. And it was one of the fastest machines for that sort of operation. But of course, the trade off is the latency of every single addition over here is much longer. And if you cannot tolerate that latency, this is not a good idea. Right? Clearly, if you want to do a very fast 32-bit operation, here you're going to take 32 cycles, here you're going to take one cycle. But the area cost is, of this is much higher. Right? 
because it's, remember that these are not connected. Because these are not connected, you don't have the additional area cost. Here, you, you really need to connect the carry chain. And in the end, carry chain becomes your latency bottleneck, as you can see. So you really need to optimize that. And people have developed hundreds of adder designs to get rid of the carry chain bottleneck. And the fundamental trade-off that they make is to reduce the latency of that carry propagation, they add more logic, hardware logic. Right? And once you add more hardware logic, it becomes even more expensive, this adder. So if your goal is to minimize latency, you really have to add more logic over here. Whereas here, you don't care as much about the latency of a single addition, you care about the throughput, so it's very simple. Okay? So embedded in, is, is in that sense very similar. So a lot of the uh, principles that are developed for programs that do bit serial uh, computation can be used for embit also. Okay. So that was a detour. Any questions on this? So if you've taken a course on computer arithmetic, actually, this you, you will have fun with a lot of adders. Yes? In the parallel adder, so any the second uh, addition is depending on the first addition, so the carry will be generated, then you can do the addition, right? So how it is like minimizing the latency? So the same thing we can do in a single adder also. Oh, uh, let me see. You mean in this one, right? Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, basically, this was a simple example. This is a ripple carry adder. In terms of latency, this is not so good, actually. If you really want to minimize the latency, you do a carry look-ahead computation, for example. Once you start doing, once you start paralyzing the carries, carry look-ahead means really uh, what you're doing is you're speculatively computing some of these bits, and then you're deciding which, com uh, which, uh, which result to take based on the carry that's generated over here. So you, you can play a lot of tricks that way. But this one actually is not great for latency. If I compare this one with the one with the serial, serial uh -huh. bottleneck, yeah. then I expect both should have the same latency because uh -huh. it, the bottleneck here is the generation of the carry, like mm -hmm. which decides what, what addition can be taken. So no, no, uh, maybe you're right, but this has other overheads, right? For example, at the end of this, you need to latch the data. So there's latching overhead okay. that you pay for, for every single bit. Whereas you don't pay that latching overhead for every single bit. And you can optimize the logic over here also. Yeah, but your point is correct actually. This is not the best design for latency, for sure. <laughs> okay, any other thoughts? Okay, so let's uh, move back to Ambit. So we've, we've talked about some examples, uh, applications. So let's talk about some other example applications. So this is actually, uh, these are some of the example applications that uh, Vivek uh, came up with. But this basically shows that uh, there are some applications that already do a lot of bitwise operations. Like bitmap indices, I'll give you an example of this. Uh, some databases actually operate on large bitmap indices and bitwise operations on those bitmap indices. Bitviewing is actually a database that's really designed to maximize the bitwise operations. And the reason why people built this database uh, was to ensure that the database can be run on GPUs. And GPUs are actually very good at doing bitwise operations. They're in the end bottlenecked by memory bandwidth. So Mbit kind of solves that memory bandwidth, right? Because you're doing these bitwise operations inside the memory. GPUs are bottlenecked by memory when they're doing bitwise operations, how fast they can bring the data. Uh, this was designed for GPUs, but they can also, it can also be used for uh, Ambit. BitFunnel is a web search engine that Microsoft designed, again, to maximize the bitwise operations. Similar principles as this one, actually. Uh, that can also be adop uh, adapted for Ambit. DNA sequence mapping, you've seen this. You can, have, you can actually have a lot of bitwise operations over there, encryption and some set operations I'm not going to talk about. Let's take a look at one example. This is uh, a bitmap index, basically. Some, uh, a lot of databases use a bitmap index al uh, as alternatives to data structures like B trees or B plus trees. Uh, and some of these bitwise operations are good at performing range queries or joins. So let's take an ex uh, look at an example. You may actually store your data this way uh, if you want to do some operations. For example, at every row, uh, you may have a student, let's say, and you may have hundreds of thousands of students, and you may have properties associated with uh, every student. This, you may basically bucket the ages, for example. You may actually bucket, uh, uh, and each bit indicates uh, if a bit is set, that means that uh, the, uh, the student 
satisfies that property uh, in that particular uh, bitmap. So if you're uh, so you may actually have other properties, like you may actually have salary buckets, you may actually have where do they live buckets, you may actually have what, what courses have they taken buckets. So you can actually think of a lot of bitmaps representing the information with a single bit in each bit, uh, for, for each row uh, uh, in each bitmap. right? So uh, if you want to do a query uh, using this sort of bitmap based representation, for example, you may search for students that are uh, between ages 18 to 25, that live in Zurich, uh, that go to ETH, that make this much money. That's all really AND and R operations right? Uh, in, on the bitmaps. So you're basically performing a huge number of AND and OR operations. And the number of AND and OR operations depend on the number of rows you have, and clearly all the, also on the number of columns you have. And a lot of databases actually operate this way. And this is a good way of operating if you want to maximize the bitwise operations. And it turns out you can map this nicely to ambit substrate. Of course, when you're mapping it nicely, now it's the programmer's burden, right? The programmer maps these bitmaps somehow onto the DRAM. That's where the difficulty comes in. And that's exactly what Vivek did in his PhD thesis. And he did map a bunch of queries on this sort of bitmap-based indices. And these are some end-to-end -end results. Basically, this shows the execution time uh, that's taken for, different, uh, for, for a given query. How fast is it with ambit compared to the baseline? Now you can see that execution time, the end-to-end -end query execution time reduces significantly. You'll read the paper for slightly more detail, but you can see 5x to 6.6x improvements, which is significant for query latency, re really reducing the latency of a query. And you can see that uh, this is the size of the database, and this is basically amount of amount of data you're looking at. And uh, the speed ups actually kind of slightly increase uh, with the amount of data you're looking at. So within this size, the amount of data that you're looking at increases. So the speed up increases from 5.7x to 6.6x. That's one good thing about uh, doing things in memory. Uh, the, the number of operations you do really scale with the data. Right? Because as long as you have subarrays, you're, you're, you can really do um, operations on every single subarray. In a sense, uh, the performance you get is really scalable with the size of the data that you have. That's not necessarily true in real systems, uh, well, existing systems, I should say, existing systems that are bottleneck by memory, right? Because you're really bottleneck by memory bandwidth at that point, and memory bandwidth really dictates how many operations you can sustain. Okay, so this is one example. Another example, this database uh, between was designed for Bit, uh, doing maximizing bitwise operations to begin with. And you can see there is also a significant performance improvement over there. Uh, Vivek adop, uh, adapted that database for execution on Ambit, and these are the results that you get. Again, 4 to 12x performance improvements. These are relatively large improvements. It's not easy to get these improvements with software changes, for example. Actually, you're, you're bottlenecked by memory bandwidth in the end. And you can also see over here as the data set size grows, the performance improvement also grows. Okay. So you will hopefully enjoy reading this paper. That's going to be one of the papers that I assign. Is it going to be interesting, you think? OK, I see some heads like this. OK. And actually, we've recently written a paper. Uh, Vivek is right now in Microsoft Research in India. Uh, but we wrote this paper uh, that talks about some of the research issues uh, that build on Ambit. Uh, and we also have a very nice background on DRAM. So if you want to uh, read the background, sec a background section on DRAM, I think this has the best background on DRAM. Maybe my, some of my other students will disagree, but this is actually very accessible. <laughs> okay, so let me raise this question over here. What do you think? <laughs> Given this example at least. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> But we've, we've been treating memory as a dumb engine for a long time. But clearly, there's a lot of capability inside there, right? It's actually surprising to me that not, not, no, no one has exploited this sort of analog computation capability inside memory until clearly 2015 or 2014. I think this, is, this points to an issue in the mindset also. Because people are not thinking that way, meaning that they're not really discovering what, what is potentially capable. Uh, uh, what you're potentially capable to do uh, in memory. And in, in, in research in general, it's always good to think broadly and expand your horizons so that you don't limit yourself. 
also, this is also true for disruptive technologies, right? If you want to come up with a disruptive technology, you should be thinking differently from the mainstream. Because that's exactly how you can contribute and make something uh, completely different, right? Okay. So basically, we have a huge challenge and opportunity for the future, which is, uh, can we design computing architectures with minimal data movement? And I think uh, Ambit is an example that goes toward that direction for sure. So let me finish uh, the detour that I have and then we'll take a break. This is going to be an easy one. Any questions so far on Ambit? Does this sound interesting? I mean, clearly there are trade-offs associated with it, right? Now people need to actually build a subarray that can do this. It may not be that easy, but it's worthwhile to explore given the benefit, potential benefits that you get. If I were a DRM company, I would be doing it right away. But sometimes, again, uh, if people are doing something for decades and decades and they're making money out of it, they may be very reluctant to change. Right? Because it's, it's a risk for them. And that risk, if you're, if you're risk averse, or if you corner yourself to be risk averse, you may not want to take that risk. That's exactly why some startups are sometimes very successful, because big companies are unable to take that risk because they're used to doing things some way and startups can actually disrupt uh, the field that way. Okay, so this, this sort of mindset actually exists everywhere. So I'm going to give you some examples over here. So it's going to be a more relaxed part of the uh, 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 le lecture, if you will. So this Ambit sounds good, right? How many people think Ambit is cool? It's okay if you don't think it's cool. How many people don't think Ambit is cool? It's fine. Okay, you can, you can think Ambit is not cool. I think it's cool. <laughs> but you don't have to agree, certainly. And clearly some of the reviewers, so uh, when, when you submit a scientific paper, you get reviews clearly uh, from people who are supposed to be experts. And sometimes you get reviews that look like this. So I'm gonna show you some examples. If you're, if you're doing research, you may actually see some of this also in your own research. <laughs> it happens. Uh, but basically the reviewer actually uh, liked the idea a lot. Uh, as you can see, the review is actually very positive. I'm not showing every review. But the review rejects the paper in the end. And the reasoning is here, basically. <laughs> Probably won't ever be built. Not practical to assume. Manufacturers will change DRM this way. I wanted to point this out because I think this is a very bad reasoning in general. Because if you actually think this way, then you can guarantee, uh, you guarantee that it will never be built, right? In science, you have to try, and you have to try these different ideas. If you're close to these ideas, then, uh, like the way I think about it is, uh, if you want to do something, you should really go and do it without thinking whether or not it's going to happen. Right? And in that case, you, you can potentially make it happen. You may, you're not guaranteed to make it happen, clearly, right? Nothing can be adopted very easily. But if you start thinking this way, no, this idea is not good, I don't think it's going to be built ever, then you guarantee that it's not going to be built ever. So you don't even try. So it's a very bad mindset, I think. And this mindset exists whenever there is a completely different idea. Or even if, uh, even if there is an idea that's slightly different, but that doesn't really uh, fit the schema of, of, of the person who is reviewing it, right? You have a question? No, okay. Okay, so you may have seen. How many people do research over here? Okay, but you may actually get this anywhere. Uh, as I, I will actually show you a book that talks about these. So you can think of the reviewer as a decision maker. The reviewer needs to make a decision. And they think it's very clever, very novel, great speed up. It's great. And the decision maker in the end rejects it because of something that is not provable at this point, right? Overcoming this comment, this weakness is very hard, I think, right? Especially in research. Go and build. I mean, you could potentially overcome this by building this device and showing that it works. But that's a lot of effort and a lot of money. And that delays progress, actually. If you, if you don't publish a paper until you really build the device, that really delays scientific progress. I'll tell you a story about that in a little bit also. But this sort of thing exists in industry. If you go to industry, for example, you will clearly get decision makers. You may come up with a great idea, but you may actually see decision makers uh, essentially destroying your idea by saying, nobody can build this. <laughs> How do you deal with this? I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> okay, so this is a review from ISCA, which is one of the top conferences in architecture. Clearly this paper didn't appear in ISCA. 
got rejected from there. Let me give you another example. This is actually a similar example. Uh, you can see that this is actually this is also a very positive review, except for this. It seems unlikely that something like this will be adopted. <laughs> it's a similar mindset in a sense. I'll give you uh, this is another review from ISCA. I'll give you another review from ISCA. This is also a relatively positive review, but it used to be called Buddy RAM, by the way. We changed the name to Ambit. <laughs> it's like a buddy to the processor. We do buddy operations. Uh, and we have an archive technical report on it uh, because it got rejected several times. Uh, but this is another uh, sort of uh, mindset issue. Basically, this, this person says, uh, this is a circuit technique. Why are you bothering me, an architect, with it? Right. This, uh, this is also a not very good mindset today because we should really be thinking across the stack. Right? This is actually, I, I disagree with this. This is really not a circuit technique in the end. It's really something that spans across the stack. Right? You have, yes, you have an insight as to performing an operation at a very basic circuit level based on charge sharing, but you need to architect the system around it to enable that operation to be exposed to the applications and the applications actually take advantage of it. Make sense? So this is actually also another different mindset. This, this is the mindset of, I only care about this part of the stack and not this other thing that I don't really care about. So you should be careful whenever you're thinking about new ideas. Part of this course, I think, what I would like to give you is really this thing about mindset. Because I think this mindset is very important in architecture in general. You really need to think uh, and be, be very open to new ideas. And if, you're, if you start selecting, oh, this idea is not an operating system idea, this idea is not an architecture idea, this idea is not a circuits idea, so I don't care about it, then it becomes very difficult to actually come up with big ideas. Okay. Okay. So this is one of my solutions to the problem, basically. You acknowledge all the reviewers that reject your papers. <laughs> yes? What do you mean when you say it, it is rejected? Uh, what are you applying to the report? Oh, so basically what happens in scientific process is the publication process. You, you write a paper, you submit the paper to a conference, and uh, there's a reviewing body that decides whether the paper gets presented and published at the conference or not. That's and if they reject the paper, that means that your paper doesn't get to be presented and published at that conference. You can, you can improve the paper and submit it to another conference or a journal. Usually in computer science, uh, and certainly in computer architecture, conferences are the uh, major venues of dissemination of scientific work. In some areas, for example, in physics, it's all about journals. Conferences are not very selective. In fact, in physics, conferences don't even do a review process, you go and send an abstract and you go and present the paper and everything is accepted basically. Because the function of the conferences over there is very different from function of the conferences in computer architecture for example. Computer architecture for conferences are more like traditional journals. They have a very rigorous selective process. Yes? And the, so the, the people you're talking to are companies and they can take the idea for example? So the review body consists of uh, academics as well as potential industry. Oh, during the conference, yes, you can talk with the companies. Yeah, companies actually read the papers. Uh, and they actually have implemented in the past uh, some of our papers. Uh, we will talk about that also. So conferences are a very good venue of dissemination because co companies actually attend those conferences and computer architecture again. That's not true for all areas of computer science. Computer architecture is an area, especially today, a lot of companies actually flood the conferences because they're in search of ideas that they can, that they can borrow from. Uh, Okay. Companies also publish papers, like the work with Roclone that was collaborative with Intel. Actually, this Ambit work was also collaborative with Intel. Does that sound interesting? Yes. Okay, yes? The person who said that this probably won't ever get built by the DIM manufacturers, did, did they mean built like ever for the, like maybe perhaps some specialized hardware, or is it never going to get mainstream? Because I don't think the idea should be dismissed if it's not going to be mainstream, like mm -hmm. coming in with every PC, with every laptop. Yeah, yeah. It has potential to be some sort of specialized speed up mm -hmm. hardware. Yeah. Well, uh, um, the, the right answer is I cannot get into the head of that reviewer, so I don't know <laughs> what they meant. But uh, I think uh, in, in the end, they probably mean mainstream, right? That's also another mindset, right? Uh, the mindset for a long time has been mainstream computing, right? This laptop. But there are a lot, today, that, that is also broken, right? We have so many different specialized architectures, like we've discussed early on. So people should be thinking differently. Okay.
so basically, I think, let me cover this and then we'll take a break, uh, this part of the lecture. This is going to be hopefully easy part, but I think this is an important part, really. Uh, I think in general we have a mindset issue. Uh, this is true whenever you're presented with a new idea. Uh, there will certainly be people who will reject the idea relatively quickly. Uh, there are many similar examples from their use. I'm going to give you more examples in a little bit for many other papers also. But also some of the industry, as I said, uh, there's a standards body called JEDEC, which really defines the standards in DRAM, for example. They're also very slow moving. They reject a lot of good ideas in general. <laughs> so this is actually prevalent in all of the industry, not, uh, not just uh, review process. I think this is actually a prevalent problem in the world. Whenever someone is so used to doing some things for a long time, they become closed to, to some of the ideas. Now that's not true for everyone clearly, right? Some people are very open-minded. But uh, you need to still overcome this problem somehow. And I think the solution is really by doing more research, education, and implementation, alternative processing paradigms. That's, what, that's one of the reasons why I use very cutting-edge examples in my freshman courses, for example. If you've taken my freshman courses, you've seen it. And I think this is really the way uh, to really get people used to these dynamic changes uh, in ideas. But somehow we, need to, we, we cannot be that way, right? We cannot reject ideas saying, this is not, it's not going to be implemented ever. We have to try. <laughs> okay, uh, related to this, has anyone used this book ever? I mean, I don't teach from this book because it's not what I teach, but this is a, a seminal book that's usually used in performance analysis uh, type of courses. Like, has anyone studied queuing theory, for example? If you studied queuing theory or scheduling theory, this book uh, uh, is one of the seminal books in that area. Uh, and I really like this book actually for its technical content, but I also like it for its non-technical content that's, that touches the technical part. And I like this one, for example. This is, uh, this, is a, this is a page from the book that I use a lot. And this page basically shows that you can run into a lot of rat holes whenever you present a new idea uh, to someone who's a decision maker. You can see that the title of this page is Decision Makers Games. So you present an idea, an analysis. Actually, in this case, they talk about performance analysis, which I think is similar to an idea in the end. And people can take issue with the workload. They can say, this is not going to work on workload X, and there are millions of workloads in the world, so you can actually exhaust that list and you will still not be alive at the end, right? <laughs> uh, and then metrics, they can take issue with what metrics you're evaluating with. They may care about energy, they may not care about performance, right? Uh, configuration and detail. And you can see this. Let's actually read this one. But basically this says, even if the performance analysis is correctly done and presented, it may not be enough to persuade your audience the decision makers to follow your recommendations. The list shown in box 10.2, which is the next page which I will show you, is a compilation of reasons for rejection heard at various performance analysis presentations. And I think you can replace performance analysis with an idea over here. Uh, uh, okay, uh, you can use the list by presenting it immediately and pointing out that the reason for rejection is not new and that the analysis deserves more consideration. Also, the list is helpful in getting the competing proposal rejected. I wouldn't recommend using the list for that purpose, but <laughs> I think this is a very smart way of writing a book. I, I wish there were more books that were written with this sort of advice in it. <laughs> well, maybe not the last one. <laughs> okay, but I think there's a lot of good advice. Basically, there's no clear end of an analysis, and I agree with this. There's really no clear end of an analysis whenever you do analysis, right? When do you stop, for example, evaluating Ambit? Do you really go and build the chip and show, demonstrate it? That's a lot of effort, actually, especially in a DRAM chip. It turns out if you really want to demonstrate some idea on a real DRAM chip, you're in trouble. Because there's really no easy academic access to a DRAM process today. You have to really sign a lot of contracts and maybe give some of your part of your arm to companies <laughs> to manufacture. And they will bind you also in terms of what you can publish and what you cannot publish. This is different from a logic process. Today, if you want to, there's actually very good infrastructure that is built so that you can actually manufacture a chip uh, that is designed using CMOS. There are actually uh, foundries that help you do that. As long as you pay the money and the development costs, that's easy. But with DRAM, it turns out there is no process to do this. So it's actually very, very difficult to do, even if you want to do it, even if you have the money to do it, even if you have the resources to do it. So that's, that's also very important to consider in general. Uh, okay. So an anal any analysis can be rejected simply on the grounds that the problem needs more analysis. <laughs> this is the first reason listed in box 10.2. The second most common reason for rejection of an analysis and for endless debate is the workload. Since, wor since workloads are always based on the past measurements, 
their applicability to the current or future environment can always be questioned. This is the example that I gave in the past. You're really designing the system at this moment in time. You have some workloads and understanding of the workloads. But the system will be in operation for 10 years downstream, right? And you have no idea what kind of workloads will be evaluated on it or executed on it. And that's not easy also to model. Uh, and you can see that actually uh, workload is one of the four areas of discussion that lead to a performance presentation into an endless debate. These rat holes and their relative size in terms of time consumed are shown in figure 10.26, which is this. Uh, presenting this cartoon at the beginning of a presentation helps to avoid these areas. <laughs> so I teach the seminar course uh, here. And in my, in my earliest lectures, I talk about, in my first lecture actually, when I introduce the seminar course, I talk about this one. So that I, uh, uh, I cut, cut down the endless debate that may happen uh, in some of the presentations. right? You should acknowledge that uh, no work can examine all of the workloads and sometimes you should also say okay this workload would be really good to examine but you can go on forever with that <laughs> okay so let's take a look at this list a little bit this is actually very interesting some of them are actually uh, relatively specific but i like this uh, well i like this last one but you can see you need a better understanding of the workload it's not simple it's also interesting Simplicity in the, is in the eyes of the beholder, but you can get these comments actually. Actually, whenever you present a new idea to any place in a company, I've seen a lot of these actually in the place that I worked in industry also. Like it may violate some future standard. How do you handle that? <laughs> it clearly violates today's standards, but what about future standards, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, this is also interesting. Our competitors don't do it. If it was a good idea, they would have done it. <laughs> That's kind of backward thinking, right? <laughs> you don't want that, clearly. You should really be thinking about, yeah, the future. Uh, okay, th this, is a, this is the duel of it. Our competition does it this way, and you don't make money by copying others. <laughs> and I like this last one over here, which is, why change? It's working okay. <laughs> I think this is the, probably the worst mindset over here. This really limits progress. Also, I think some of the other things are interesting here. This impacts hardware, for example. That's a certain mindset uh, if you're a software company. But a lot, as we discussed, all of the software companies have already broken that barrier. They're all designing hardware today also. Uh, at least the ones that are really pushing the boundaries. Okay. Anyway, some of these are interesting. But I think this is something that I present in conferences also. Like, there, there needs to be a solution to this your accountability problem because really, it's really limiting the progress in science. This, I mean, this thing is this thing limits progress everywhere. I think. Like, if you have a problem, if you don't solve it, and if you say it's working okay, I'm not going to deal with it. I'm not going to look at the better future. Then that limits progress. But in science, it's specifically you're limiting the progress in uh, scientific progress. So just like main memory needs intelligent controllers, we need more accountable reviewers. <laughs> I think this is true for sure. So this is a suggestion. So if you may or may not review papers, but I think uh, like new papers, you're, all, you're clearly reviewing papers that are published, which is fine, and you should do, you'd be very critical about that. But if you're reviewing new papers or new ideas, I think this is always good to keep in mind. Uh, and I presented this actually in some conferences, uh, and people were, uh, some, some, some people who have been doing research in the area for 30, 40 years, uh, really like this one. So I would like to present it also. Uh, but basically I think this is very important. Uh, it's very important to recognize that you do not know it all. For example, you may have the mindset that this is not going to work in a mainstream computing system, but that's not the only place this could potentially be applied. Right? It could be applied anywhere. Right? Once the idea gets out, you never know where it will impact. Right? Uh, oh, exa that's exactly the reason why people should be open-minded when they are presented with new ideas. And I think this is also important. Uh, like there, there are many diff different methods of evaluation and methods of research. And it's important to be accepting all those diverse methods of research and evaluation. You may be used to doing evaluation this way, but maybe there are other ways of actually evaluating ideas. Right? Like you may be used to doing uh, simulation all the time. If someone doesn't simulate, but actually does, builds an analytical model and presents an idea, as long as that analytical model is correct, maybe that's okay, right? The goal is to really, you just acknowledge the downsides of that potential evaluation, but maybe move on, right? <laughs> uh, I think this is also important in general. And, well, this, this goes into the fairness part also, like double standards. That's, people should be very careful with the double standards, I think, in general. But basically, I think it's important not to delay scientific progress or progress in general for non-reasons. 
Okay, so with that said, I think this is very, it's very interesting. Right? You, you saw those reviews that said DM manufacturers will never do it. Right? But it turns out existing DRAM chips are actually capable of doing some of these bitwise operations. I mean, we didn't find this out, but people recently built on our work and bit work, and they basically showed that you could, uh, in existing DRAM chips, without changing any hardware at all, you could actually uh, get these bitwise operations, bitwise and, uh, and or. So what they've shown is basically uh, they took off-the-shelf DRAMs and they attached it to the FPGA-based memory controller that we talked about last time. So they used our infrastructure, SoftMC, which I mentioned last time. And they reduced the timing parameters. So basically they, uh, they were able to uh, get the behavior of triple row activation by reducing the timing parameters uh, between uh, different activates. So you activate and you would violate the timing parameter that DRAM, DRAM standard says you cannot activate before this many cycles but they said we're going to ignore that we're going to activate again and activate again very quickly and it turns out in some DRAM chips you get the ability to activate three rows at the same time and they showed that in, in the DRAM chip that, that they've tested they get results very similar to AMBIT so it's very interesting, right? this is five years later or five years, or three, actually, based on our research five years later, yes. <laughs> it was published in 2017, but the research was done earlier. Uh, so this is, I think, uh, the interesting thing about scientific progress, right? You, again, you do not know it all. Uh, someone may do, may build on your work and actually show that it is even potentially doable. Now, I don't think this is a really good way uh, of doing it, because this is actually really, in my opinion, uh, so by the way, this paper also shows that you can do row clone in existing VM chips. If you can do triple row activation, it's a lot easier to do uh, consecutive activates, right? Uh, I do not think this is a good way of really building computation because you're not changing the DRAM chip. Right? I think it's better, you, you, and they show that you could do it reliably in some rows, but not so reliably in other rows, and some rows don't even work that way. If you really design DRAM to do it, then you're, you're much more robust. But I really like this because this shows that this kind of gives the answer to the, to the reviewer, right? Maybe you, don't, you do not know it all, right? <laughs> That's the answer. So somebody actually shows it later on. And actually, there's other work. That, uh, this is based on simulation. It's not based on real DRAM chips. But it turns out uh, this work was published earlier than the AMBIT paper. But they actually used the same principles as AMBIT because our work was actually published uh, uh, in archive before. And they actually credit uh, our work. They showed that you could do very similar operations in uh, non-volatile memories, and in particular phase change memory in this case. They basically showed that you could accelerate graph applications and machine learning applications. They went a step ahead, uh, in my opinion, uh, compared to what we showed. They actually showed that you could use the substrate of doing bitwise AND and OR and cloning uh, to get uh, significant performance improvements in machine learning and graph processing. So I'd recommend looking at this paper also if you're interested. Okay. I mean, clearly there are actually many examples of why change is working okay. I can go on and on in real life as well. Uh, but basically, uh, let's see how many examples that I would really like to talk about. Uh, okay, we, this actually uh, limits progress, and there are many exa such examples in real life. I will give you one example uh, that, is, that you, may, uh, you may have encountered also. This, this shocked me actually when I encountered it. And I think this is not um, an aberration uh, in the sense that because I, I travel a lot and I go through the Zurich airport many times, probably more times than I really want to, uh, but there's something that I noticed uh, in terms of bandwidth waste in Zurich airport. Maybe some, how many people travel through Zurich airport a lot? Little? Okay. Maybe you, you, won't, you won't know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, and I think this is similar to the bandwidth waste that we have uh, in computing systems. But let me uh, tell you what the story is. So the story is, uh, you have a terminal, and you have the passport uh, and baggage claim, right? Okay? And what connects these things is a train, just like the memory bottleneck. Actually, you could call it a tram, I guess. I don't know if it's a tram or a train. Whatever. It's something that moves between them uh, on rails. 
Uh, okay, so this part is fine. Clearly, if you have a huge over overload over here and they want to go over here, you're bandwidth bottlenecked by that train, and also latency bottlenecked. But there's something interesting that I noticed inside that train. So there's an area where you board the train. I'm going to zoom into that area over here. Uh, so this area is divided into two, and there's a door in between. And let's assume that this is the train tracks over here. Let's ignore this one. So clearly there's a door, and you have some stairs, and you go into this part. Okay? And then there are some other stairs that bring some other people from this part. So it's kind of bandwidth partitioning. Right? Let me use some other uh, color over here. So a lot of, a lot of these things actually uh, resemble a computing system. Uh, so basically you have, let's say this is channel 1, and this is channel 2. And the train looks like this. Basically when the train comes, part of the train is over here, and part of the train is over here. Do people know what I'm talking about? I think some people do. Okay. So let's assume that you're a person coming down and you're waiting for the train over here. The store is locked. You cannot go over there. Uh, now, what happens is there are a lot of people waiting over here. And the train comes. And they fill this part of the train. But this part of the train is empty because there's no one over here. And I noticed this a lot. And, and the end result is people who are over here get crammed and some of them actually cannot get on the train. So what's happening over here? Basically you partition the bandwidth of the train. This is zero. This is basically capacity. And because you don't allow the overflow bandwidth to use this one, you're really wasting the bandwidth and making people wait over here. Does that make sense? So I hope I was able to convey the problem. <laughs> It's very similar to a bandwidth partitioning system, right? You partition. Now, of course, this works nicely if there are also a lot of people over here, right? Basically, if your load is balanced. Clearly, in many cases I've been through this airport, load is not balanced. Actually, it's very hard to balance the load, I think, and ensure that there are the same amount of people over here and here. So I think this is, that was kind of the intent, perhaps, in, in the design initially of this system. But the system is not working very well because somebody needs to monitor the load all the time, right? Clearly there are solutions to this problem. By opening that door, you can solve the problem easily, right? <laughs> but that door is not open. <laughs> okay? But this is an example of real bandwidth waste in real system that affects people's lives because if you're stuck over here, you'll have to wait for the next train, which comes two and a half minutes later. And if you want to catch another train later on, you may actually miss your connection. Okay? So I, th I think of this as a mindset problem also because I think if I have realized that somebody must have, mu else must have realized it also. But maybe that's also not true, I don't know. Maybe I tra I've traveled a lot through the airport that I, it, it hits me right away. Or maybe I'm particularly conscious about these wastage that happens in systems in general. <laughs> okay, so I mean we will talk about something called memory channel partitioning later on. You, you actually run into exactly the same problems. If you, want to ch if you want to partition the channels, for example, memory channels, across different applications, you run into exactly the same problem. You've allocated this channel to this application, and this application may be using it at capacity, but then it cannot, if you do hard partitioning, some other application may not be using this channel as much, but maybe you're wasting bandwidth, right? Uh, because this application needs more bandwidth, but this application it cannot get more bandwidth because you hard partition the channels. That's the idea. And you may actually get good performance as long as you balance the load across the channels, but balancing the load in general is a very tough problem. That's true for computing systems, that's true for human systems as well, at least in, in this particular human system. But I think in general, whenever you want to balance load, you need to schedule really well. And clearly in the airport, it's not scheduled really well in this case. Okay, so that's one example of uh, uh, the bandwidth waste. Let's see how many other examples I want to cover. I guess we could go on and on over here. 
I'll give you maybe one more example. I mean, this, this is also very interesting, but I'm not going to talk about that. Tan Bar is a very good example of that, actually. We'll talk about that when we talk about quality of service. But this, this, is, this is also very interesting. I think this is also an interesting mindset. I don't think I gave this example before, over here. But let me give that example. <laughs> so, uh, there, there used to be... Uh, okay, not that example. Is this boring? Should we stop and take a break? Okay, we'll take a break after this then. <laughs> or after the, another example that I have over there. So let's assume that uh, you have, this is a river. This is two sides of the city. Well, I guess this could be Manhattan, right? This doesn't look this way, but, and this could be Brooklyn. This is New York City. I'm not choosing Zurich as an example because I don't think Zurich has as bad traffic. <laughs> but basically, you have a bridge over here that's overloaded. <laughs> Meaning you, you always have traffic jam, right? And you want to decide whether or not you want a second bridge on the river. It's going to be more of a joke, actually. <laughs> but this points out to the mindset issue also. The question is, do you really want to build that bridge? So what do you do? You send a bunch of people uh, to the river. They basically start scanning the river from this side. And they try to figure out whether there are any cars that are trying to cross the river at that point. So you go here, observe, record every day. How many, how many cars are, supposed, are trying to cross the river here. You go here, record how many cars are trying to cross the river here. You go here, do that recording. You come here, do that recording over here also. And voila, what do you find out? There are zero cars that are really trying to cross the bridge or cross the river over here. But everybody is trying to cross the river over here. So let's not build another bridge. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> I mean, this may look funny, but this is really the mindset issue in the end. And I think it gets to the heart of it. This is the way we do it. And there's nothing that's happening that indicates otherwise. So let's keep the same way. I don't think this is a real story, but I like the story. <laughs> because I think that really gets to the heart of the mindset issue. Okay. So let me give you another example and then we'll take a break. I like this other example also because it also indicates an interesting mindset issue. Uh, so we talked about the Rohammer paper, right? Uh, you think it was accepted the first time? How many people think it was accepted right away with all the results in it? Good, you know better now with the mindset picture over there. <laughs> if people are thinking that way, then yes, <laughs> right? And it was not accepted the first time when it was first uh, reviewed in a conference, it was rejected, as you can see over here. And these are the reviewer scores, so it got six reviews, you can see. And overall merit is, a, and uh, basically five is a very good score in this particular case. Four is a reasonably good score. Clearly one is, one, uh, the reviewer who gives a one is saying, this paper should, should be ex accepted over my dead body. <laughs> Meaning you have to kill me for me to accept this paper, right? <laughs> and you can see that there are a couple of, two, a couple of ones and a couple of twos. And they, in the paper, in, in the end, the paper was rejected. Uh, let's take a look at uh, what the reviewer said. For example, this one. I think this is missing the point, basically. Clearly, this reviewer doesn't have a lot of other weaknesses, then they don't really care about test methodology. <laughs> Which is a bit sad, because I, I also disagree with the fact... This, this is the uh, mindset that really limits someone to a particular area, right? Rohammer is clearly much beyond test methodology. But even if we consider that, that is the case, I don't think that's a good reason to reject a paper, right? Or, or an idea, again. Or, or something that's really demonstrated in real systems. So in, in a sense, it's very hard to argue against Rohammer because it's really demonstrated on a real system. And when we first wrote the paper, it was very similar to the current paper that you have read or you are reading. So this is, a, this is, a, this is an example of mindset, uh, I will say. This is also another example of a mindset that's actually interesting. The authors don't show it can be an issue in realistic DRM usage. Now, you've already seen there's many, many works that show that this is a security issue. Maybe it doesn't appear in realistic DRM usage as much. That could be true. But should this really be 
the criterion, right? This is very similar to what you said, right? Because nothing has to be, uh, uh, an idea doesn't have to happen only in mainstream cases, right? It could be a security problem. If you think a bit broadly, uh, get out of that mindset, you can actually think of an idea or a problem to be actually a problem in many different places. By the way, this is also not true. I, I gave you the story, right? In some real programs, this, this actually happens. Now, we cannot necessarily write about them because industry actually ha ha has figured out very, in very, very painful ways that this sort of thing happens in real programs and it's very hard to debug those things. But, uh, yeah, that's the mindset. Okay, this is also uh, uh, a problem, I think. Okay, this is also interesting. Uh, this, 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 uh, this, this reviewer dismisses it. This is another kind of rejection that you can potentially get. In whenever you present an idea. They can easily dismiss something saying, this has already been done. But whenever you get a rejection like this, you should really poke and say, okay, where is it done? Can you actually show me the work that has actually showed the real DRAM chips are actually vulnerable to this effect? Right? So you may actually, there are, there are actually defenses that you can develop against these kind of arguments against your ideas. Uh, and I've seen this many times, not just for my papers, but someone basically sees an idea and says, oh, this is the same as this other idea. But they don't even, they're not even specific. Right? They don't even talk about what that idea is. Like this, right? It's not specific. It's one of many well-known read disturb mechanisms. It's actually, the paper acknowledges that. It's about read disturbance, right? I mentioned that this, this is, uh, read disturbance happens in many types of memories. But the fact that it really slips into the field is a big problem. And no one has ever shown that the sort of read disturbance actually exists in the field. Okay, anyway, basically, uh, this paper did not appear in Micro 2013. That's a, that's a takeaway. Uh, so later, actually, there's, the story is interesting. I mean, we did all of these experiments for Micro 2013 also, and all of these chips were actually tested in that paper also. So really, nothing has changed uh, in the paper except we made it better. Uh, so we fast forward six months, the paper is submitted to another conference, and now you get interesting reviews. Uh, Rohammer actually, uh, we, we did a lot of this research together with Intel, started in around 2012. So those were the times when uh, the industry was also looking into the issue, uh, clearly Intel, right? Uh, but, the, but there was no exposure. Intel actually filed a bunch of patents to protect against Rohammer, some of which are in use today. Uh, but uh, the series is interesting. Uh, I don't know if this is the same per person who actually rejected uh, the paper before, but uh, fast forward six months, they say that now their issue is actually coming up, people are actually talking about it. They say, oh, this is not interesting because you can even find a YouTube video on it. <laughs> it's very interesting to dismiss all of this analysis that you do in a paper with a YouTube video that talks about throw hammer for one minute or 30 seconds. I actually know that exact video because I was at that conference where this video was presented. It talks about you can potentially detect uh, these row hammer type of failures uh, with a testing equipment which this person is trying to sell in that conference. <laughs> it doesn't have any analysis, any scientific analysis, but it's, it's amazing that uh, earlier it's not an issue, now oh it's an issue but it's not interesting because there's a YouTube video. <laughs> So keep this in mind. This is the fairness aspect, as you can see, right? This is actually another, another one. Is, these are the ones who rejected the paper. You can see that it appears to be well known. <laughs> and solutions have already been proposed. Actually, we work with the people who actually propose those solutions. <laughs> so that's the you do not know it all part <laughs> as well, right? And actually, the paper, whenever, when it was submitted to Micro, we referenced those patent applications. Those, at that time, those patent applications by Intel were pending. Uh, and those patent applications are referenced in the paper saying that industry is aware of the problem and they're actually filing patents on this problem. Okay, but the good news is there were enough people who appreciated uh, the work and you can see that four reviewers gave very high scores. I think eight was the top score over here and the paper was accepted. But it's very interesting, I think, in hindsight, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's important to put these ideas in context because I think, I believe a lot of these ideas are actually, actually get delayed because of this sort of what I would call uh, random or flaky or sometimes maybe malicious reviews in general. Uh, so whenever you see an idea, uh, don't take it for granted because there may be a very long story behind that idea in terms of its acceptance. Right? 
It may, it may actually take a very long time to get an idea to be accepted. Okay, let's assume that this paper was not accepted for, let's say, five or six conferences. Then how, how, would, how would science be after that, right? It's also good to think about it that way, right? I don't know, actually, because as we've discussed, this paper enabled a lot of research in security community, right? Security community was really looking for these bit flips. And they found out, they found these bit flips, and as a result, they enabled a lot of very interesting hardware security research. So I think uh, whenever there's a new idea, a new demonstration, it's very important to be very open-minded. Because once you make a rejection decision, that may actually impact whatever is coming next, right? And you cannot predict, you cannot possibly predict what's coming next. I don't think anybody has that power. Uh, if you claim that AI will have that, have that power sometime, I'd, love, I'd really love to know, but I don't believe that it'll have that power anytime soon also. So that's the mindset, basically. That, that's why I wanted to spend this much amount of time on the mindset, because that mindset really affects... Science is one example. certainly affects science and scientific progress, but our real lives also. Right? I gave you this example, maybe it's a small example from the Zurich airport, uh, and a lot of things work in some countries, but it's, it's important not to... Uh, get to the mindset that it's working okay. Why change? That's not a good mindset anywhere. <laughs> Actually, it's working okay. Today, I think, uh, that's, uh, you, can, you can make that argument for climate today, like sustainability. It's working okay right now, right? It's perfectly fine, I think. We're living our lives. Who cares about climate? I think it's important to, uh, you, if, if you have that mindset 10 years later, you may not be around. <laughs> That may be the, perhaps the worst possible scenario, but that could happen, really. Okay. Anyway, let me, uh, let me finish with some positive notes. So I, I believe I will design this paper so that you will see the research that has been enabled on top of Rohammer. It's a long paper, but hopefully it will be fun to read. But basically, I think in general, uh, this is, this, this, these slides I also presented in some conferences. Basically, it's really important to follow your passion. There will be always naysayers, people who say no to any idea or your ideas. You should make sure that you do not get derailed by them. You should acknowledge they exist and maybe spend one hour crying, but after that move on. Right? <laughs> it's really important. You need to follow your passion. You need to believe in an idea. That's how you really can change the world. And I think resilience is very important. That's essentially the same as the previous slide, but being resilient is very important whenever you want to make an idea to w work or whenever you want to solve a problem. Because in the end, we are solving problems, right? You may be solving the problem of uh, this bandwidth waste at the Zurich airport. That's a problem. But being resilient is important in terms of solving the problem. Uh, I think in the end, uh, at least in terms of research, it's critical to focus on learning and scholarship. Uh, because that's what really matters. That's the most significant bit, if you will. And in the end, the quality of the work really defines the impact that you have. That's true for industry also. If you go to industry, the quality of the analysis that you do, it may not be accepted initially, but if you're resilient and if you follow your passion, and if you show, demonstrate it really well, then that will define your impact. No question about that. I've seen many examples of this. Okay, any questions? I think I've taken a very long detour. But hopefully it's an important detour. I don't think you see this in many lectures, but I think it's really important to have this sort of discourse uh, in an academic environment. And some of these things are actually not talked about also. Like whenever people get rejections, sometimes they try to hide it. I think that's not a good approach actually, because rejections are actually everywhere. <laughs> and sometimes, uh, uh, like sometimes my, my students get upset when they get a paper rejected. I tell them exactly the same thing. You're allowed to maybe have one hour and then you have to move on. And then there's a list of papers that I sometimes send that basically uh, were rejected once or twice or more, but then they, want, they, uh, they, uh, they went and won the Nobel Prize in the end, even though they may not be published at the top venues. So it's good to keep things in perspective, right? Okay, so I think this is a good place to... Stop and take a break. Okay, so let's continue where we left off. Unfortunately, probably we're not going to be able to finish computation memory today, given, it, given the speed we're going with. But hopefully, hopefully what we're covering is interesting. Okay, so uh, we finally, we're finally done with minimally changing memory chips, that direction. Now we're going to talk about exploiting emerging or some existing uh, 3D stack memory technologies. 
And always keep this in mind. We're thinking differently from past approaches. We're not trying to put a full chip uh, inside the memory. And we're still thinking of memory as an accelerator in this case, right? Okay, so let's, what is 3D stack memory? I think I've already given you the idea, but basically uh, today we're able to stack uh, logic layers underneath or on top of memory layers, as you can see. This is one example, you have a logic layer uh, that is connected to the memory layers. This is another view of it. Basically, uh, in logic layer you can essentially build anything that's logic. In memory layers, this is mainly memory cells and subarrays, very similar to uh, a memory chip, if you will. But the connection from uh, the row buffers to, uh, to the logic layer is done through these uh, interconnects called true silicon vias. Basically, these are simple vias. Uh, they're not the large interconnects between a processor and memory, they're relatively small. As a result, they're more energy efficient and they're low latency and they, there are many of them, as you can see. Today, if you look at a, a memory chip, you can get, let's say, 16 bits out of a memory chip. Here, you're getting, let's say, thousands of bits, let's say 4,000 bits at the same time. That's the idea. Uh, and this is enabled by, clearly, uh, process technology and uh, the ability to stack multiple, chip, multiple layers on top of each other. Okay, so it's basically memory and logic stacking. That's what it's called. I'm not going to go into exactly how it's done. There's clearly a lot of research that has gone into how to do it at the circuit level, how to do it at the fabrication layers. It's not easy. It's been painful, but people are able to do it right now. In fact, there, as I will show you in a couple of slides, uh, there are many memory technologies that are build, being built using these principles. And actually, there are other, even more true three-dimensional technologies that are under development. These true silicon vias, TSVs, as they're called, they're actually relatively large, meaning that they occupy a lot of area. Uh, so they're not as simple as some wire that you have in a single layer. In a single layer, you can have wires, right? And those are relatively small. But these true silicon vias still need to be relatively large to be robust. So they occupy too much area, so you cannot put a lot of them. Uh, in a single chip. Uh, uh, in, in, in some of the technologies that are under development, uh, you have essentially uh, something similar to the wires that you have on a, uh, in a single layer going vertically. And that's exactly what you want in a future technology, I think. You have wires that are horizontal and you have wires that are vertical and you don't really don't want them to be different from each other. You really want them both to be very small and energy efficient, right? And I think these two 3D dimensional technologies are going to be even more important going into the future. One of the examples of this is uh, uh, the next project at Stanford, for example. They actually showed that using carbon nanotubes, you can stack these chips, uh, stack these layers with very simple, uh, small connections. Uh, of course, it's a little bit out there. Uh, it's, it's, it's not clear when these uh, other technologies will become cost effective, but it's good to do the research to enable them today. So we're not going to talk about those technologies yet. We're going to talk about these 3D stacking technologies that, that are almost uh, everywhere, although they're expensive right now still. Okay, so this was a, based on a paper that we wrote in 2015, based on this Ramulator paper, which we will later talk about when we talk about simulation. But you can see that I as early as 2011, there are some 3D stacked memory technologies that are available. These are different DM standards over here. And this, this simulator is able to model uh, a lot of DRAM standards. That's one of the uh, benefits of the simulator. Uh, it's fast and flexible and extensible. Uh, and you can see that wide I.O. is some technology that was available. Uh, this is Intel's technology. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember what exactly they called MC, but MC DRAM. HBM, high bandwidth memory. That's, uh, that's actually currently used by a lot of GPUs because GPUs demand a lot of bandwidth. And these technologies actually enable a lot of bandwidth uh, to the logic layer. Uh, and uh, as a result, they're a very good fit for GPUs. They found a lot of use in GPUs, and some FPGAs actually use HPM today also. Okay, anyway, you don't really need to know about these different names clearly, but this is to show you that uh, there are a bunch of different technologies that are already there uh, that can stack memory and logic. So, okay, we have these 3D stacked memory plus logic technologies, then what can we do with it? Can we do processing in memory with them? And uh, we're kind of going to take a similar approach. We're going to uh, talk about what can you do kind of maximally by changing the entire system when you have these technologies and what, you, what can you do minimally. So the first one is about what's, what's the maximal thing that you can do if you don't have any limits in terms of what you can change. 
what are the performance and energy benefits of using 3D stacked uh, memory as a coarse-grained acceleration mechanism for different applications uh, by changing the entire system. And whenever you want to change the entire system and you want to look at the limits of performance and energy that you get, it's always good to consider an application. And you want to specialize the system for that application slightly. And we're going to look at graph processing as an application in this case. And graph processing is very interesting actually, but we will talk about it when we get to it. And then we will gradually make things uh, less maximal, if you will. We're going to change less and less. For example, we're going to do, instead of changing the entire system, we're going to keep a lot of the system principles the same, but we're going to do simple function offloading to the memory. Identify some functions that you think are very good fit for executing inside memory and ship them to memory. Clearly, that's not going to change the entire system. In this changing the entire system part, we're going to change the programming model also, for example. And then we're going to ask the question, what is the minimal processing and memory support we can provide? This is actually very good for adoption issues. Uh, and minimal means with minimal changes to the system, with minimal changes to programming. And we're going to see an example of this. And clearly, as we go from um, changing the entire system to minimal change to the system, the performance and energy benefits are going to reduce. Because once you have the flexibility to change the entire system, you can redesign the system to get the highest performance and efficiency benefits. That's also a fundamental principle. Right? If, you, if you want to tweak the system minimally, you will not be able to uh, really uh, get a whole lot of benefits, but it may be easier to adopt in real systems. And whenever you're looking at an idea that changes the paradigm, it's good to explore both ends. This is kind of the potential, and this is kind of what you can do almost today. Right? Okay, does that sound good? Okay, so let's start with the first one. Uh, how can we change the system uh, entirely to accelerate an important application? And for, uh, clearly we could, we could have choos chosen any application, but we were very interested in graph processing when we were first started doing research in this area. And a lot of people actually have a lot of work on graph processing today that's built on what, I, what I'm going to describe in a little bit. But why is graph processing interesting? Because we actually represent a lot of data that we have in terms of graphs. And we operate on those graphs in real applications. For example, Wikipedia is based on graphs, Facebook is based on a lot of graph analytics, uh, all of these social networks are actually based on a lot of graph connections. But it's not just social networks. Today, bioinformatics is done on graphs. People represent the genomes, for example, using graphs uh, and operate based on those graphs. Machine learning, a lot of machine learning frameworks actually are based on graph processing also. So it's much beyond that. And you can see that my slide is kind of up, out of date because this is not 1.4 billion today, apparently. When I give this talk at Facebook, they used to correct me, uh, saying that it's, it's, I think it's around 2.33 billion today, which is kind of amazing, right? 2.32 billion people give up their privacy. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> but we, we discussed this kind of, right? There are two kinds of people. People who are willing to completely give up whatever they have, privacy, and people who really don't want to do that. <laughs> but apparently, the majority is here. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, jokes aside, now I don't need to change my slide by putting this circa 2015 over there, right? Because clearly, I'm, I'm sure this has improved, uh, increased also. And there, there are certainly Chinese competitors to all of these, right? I think. Uh, I think Weibo, for example, has almost close to 1 billion users. Somebody told me that. Uh, so clearly they're competitors. But I think a lot of those are also graph-based. But it turns out scalable large-scale graph processing is very challenging uh, for, for reasons that I will, I'm going to show you in the next slide, actually. Because it's mainly memory bottlenecked. That's the reason. Uh, so uh, this is one example. If you take uh, an algorithm like PageRank, which is really used to rank uh, uh, popularity, it's used for a lot of web page search algorithms. Uh, it's variants of it is used. And in, if you quadruple the number of cores, you don't get a lot of performance benefit, basically. Ideally, I mean, you're, you're quadrupling the number of cores, you're getting only 40%, 40%, right? Even though this is a relatively parallelizable workload. Okay? Uh, and and the, the main reason is you have a lot of random memory accesses. Basically, you're operating on a graph and you're calculating some rank based on the neighbors. Uh, of this particular uh, graph node. And whenever you're doing that, you actually have a lot of ran free, uh, random memory accesses to different random locations. Uh, random meaning you cannot predict uh, the locations that you're accessing at that point. Uh, and you do a little amount of computation on each node. 
you basically do this computation and add it to a rank. That's the rank computation. That's the core kernel of page rank algorithm, for example. And you can see that this is memory bottleneck, right? You're, every time you're accessing memory, you're not even, you do not have enough computation to overlap the memory accesses. As a result, if you throw cores at the problem, you're not getting a lot of performance benefit because your memory bandwidth and is not increasing and your memory latency is certainly not reducing when you add more cores. Okay, so uh, then actually uh, having something, having, having this computation done inside uh, the logic layer in memory makes sense because what happens is you reduce the latency of access uh, and you also enable very high amounts of bandwidth uh, to do many of these accesses in parallel at the same time as opposed to being bottlenecked by this bandwidth bottleneck which is the memory bus that's the idea that's why pushing computation to the memory makes a lot of sense for this sort of application whenever you see a lot of random memory accesses and little amount of computation probably you shouldn't be bringing that data into the processor just push the computation to the memory such that you don't need to go through the entire hierarchy because you're not going to benefit from the entire hierarchy for many of these accesses actually Okay, and this is the system design that we came up with. This is another paper that may be on your homework, we'll see. But basically, it's a, it's a full system design paper. It starts with this memory plus logic uh, layers. And if, uh, it builds the entire system and the programming model uh, around it. And if you look at this, we start with this logic layer. If you look at the logic layer internally, it actually consists of what is called vaults. These vaults are really partitions. And in each vault, you have a memory controller. So this depicts the, each vault. Normally, you have a memory controller that controls the memory stack on top of it. So you basically partition uh, this chip, let's say, into, I don't know how many over here, but let's say 64. 64 of these memory controllers. And each of them control the memory on top of it. And they, are commu uh, they can communicate with each other with some sort of network. So they can actually send messages to each other. Uh, that's the basic design. On top of this, to each of these vaults or partitions, we add a single in-order core. Very simple in-order core. This is actually a general purpose core. It's an embedded core. It's not very high performance. It's low power because you really want low power inside this logic layer because we're going to add, let's say, 64 of these cores, each one being in, in one of the vaults, uh, and they're going to operate in parallel. Right? That's the idea. So this in-order core, it's actually a very general, general purpose system from that perspective. The core can process anything. It's actually a simple ARM core in this case. Uh, and these cores are connected to each other via some network. In this case, it's a crossbar. We will actually cover interconnects later on. It's a fascinating topic. But uh, for, for right now, it's assume that it's a crossbar and assume that you know what that is. We'll, we'll get back to that. <laughs> uh, but crossbar is a costly network where you actually connect things in terms of uh, X and Y in, in, in all dimensions. You don't do point to point. Basically, every core doesn't have connections to every other core directly, but you do it in a two dimensional grid. Uh, that's all about what I want to say <laughs> in terms of crossbars. We'll get back to it. But assume that they, these cores can communicate with each other uh, internally. Uh, okay. Basically, uh, what we do is we partition the data on top of these uh, memory layers. So you partition your graph. And whenever you want to operate on a graph node, you send a message to the core that houses that node. That's the idea. So this is very different from the model that we have today. Whenever you want to operate on a graph node, you bring the data into the core, right? And then do some operation. And whenever you want to do something to another graph node, you bring that graph node to the core. Here we say, no, we're not going to move the graph nodes. They're going to be partitioned across these memory on top of these vaults. And if you want to do an operation uh, on a graph node, like add a value to that graph node, or uh, get the value of that graph node and add it to some temporary value, you basically send the function to the core that houses the node, and that core will execute that function. Data will not be moved around, and you can move the intermediate results, of course. So you can send the intermediate results. That's the idea over here. Or you can update that particular node if you want to update the value of that node. Does that make sense? So we're not moving the data. We're going the extreme opposite in this case. Data doesn't move. Data meaning uh, the graph nodes don't move. Uh, you move the computation to the data and you can update the graph nodes over there and if you have intermediate results of course you need to move them so that you can do some addition with those intermediate results right uh, okay 
So basically this requires you to partition the graph. Okay, but this is one chip. One chip may have, let's say, 16 gigabytes or 32 gigabytes of memory. Of course, hopefully this will scale and you will still have a lot of memory in a single chip. But even if you assume that you have one terabytes, maybe it's not enough for a very large graph, right? So you really need to scale up. To be able to scale up, what do you do? You basically, we basically connect these chips together. Uh, with off-chip interconnects. So you have some other network over here. In this case, the network is Dragonfly. Again, you don't need to know what that network is, but there's a lot of research on network interconnection networks, and uh, the quality of inter your interconnection network determines your connectivity, of course. right? But assume that these things can be connected to each other. But this is different because now you have chip boundaries. right? A single chip is like this. Now you have many chips together so that you can house very large graphs. Again, you do the graph partitioning, but you need to be careful with your graph partitioning because you, even though things access are relatively random, there's some locality in the graph. So for those nodes where, that, are, that are communicating with each other a lot, you want to put them on the same chip. And within the same chip, as close as possible. But this, that's less of a problem within the same chip because within the same chip, the chip is not extremely large. So moving the computation from here to the worst end may not be bad. Right? But going off-chip off is bad, so you should be very careful in terms of how you partition your graph. So basically, the programmer partitions the graph on top of these chips and within the chip across the vaults and rewrites the graph application such that computations that are done on top of graph nodes are shipped as function calls to the cores that house the graph nodes. Make sense? And this may be familiar, this is a message passing based system. So basically, you're sending messages to the cores that house the data. And if you look at the interface to the host processor, we, we, we thought of this as an accelerator. So you can think of this as an interface that looks kind of like a GPU, or early GPU. Basically, you offload a program to the GPU, GPU runs the program forever. Right. That's the idea. Or until the program ends. And actually, it's very similar to early GPUs. You have some accelerator interface. Uh, you have completely physical addressing over here. So the program needs to deal with physical addresses and then ensure that the data it all fits in here or they need to deal with disk accesses. We don't need to deal with disk, disk accesses in this case. And we, we, uh, we basically say that uh, cache coherence is not a problem over here because everything is message passing based. You don't duplicate the data uh, in different nodes. So we kind of sidestep some of the important system issues that may otherwise arise because we have the entire freedom to change the system. You send a message to a node, you don't duplicate the data. You don't duplicate the different graph nodes and caches of different nodes. Right? That's the idea. OK. Any questions? That's a full system stack paper, so I may, I may not talk about everything here clearly. Yes? Yeah, different nodes over here. Right? That's why graph partitioning is very important, actually. So you still want to exploit some locality in the graph. I mean, even Facebook graph has some locality, right? You're not communicating with the entire world. You usually communicate with a group of friends. And I think if I were partitioning a graph like Facebook graph, for example, I would figure out those clusters that usually communicate with each other, and I would map those clusters to a single chip <laughs> as much as possible. You cannot be perfect, of course, because sometimes you will add a new friend, right? And now <laughs> that's maybe over here. So I think ideally, if you really want to use a system like this in uh, that type of graph, you may need to migrate you may need to repartition the graph some, once in a while. Of course, that's a high overhead operation, right? So you cannot do it every time. So th basically, this, this still exploits. Uh, there, there needs to be some locality to exploit for this one. <laughs> uh, if there's no locality, you're still getting some benefit because you're reducing the latency of access. Uh, but, I mean, you're losing a lot of, uh, you're, you're adding a lot of communication overhead. But that communication overhead was there anyway. So hopefully you're not losing anything compared to the baseline system. That's a very good question. Any other ones? Yes? But then the programmer must know exactly where, where is located each node and exactly 
Cheap, exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the downside of this. Okay. Yeah. But we can change everything in the system in this case. We're dreaming. <laughs> that's the beauty of being an architect, right? You can explore the limits of something without being bound by, uh, in a sense, real life constraints completely. Yes, in this case, the programmer needs to worry about a lot of things. Is it possible to add some sort of controller or something no. like this? Do their mapping, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. I think I think those things we didn't worry about in this case. But uh, if you really want to deploy it in real life, I think having some controller that helps the programmer that does remapping, so the programmer has some sort of virtual address for the graph, not necessarily virtual memory, but kind of virtual mapping for the graph, and internally there's some remapping that's done. I think that's certainly a more uh, easy to program or easier to program system. But we didn't care about programmability in this case. <laughs> and early GPUs were kind of like this, actually. People didn't really care about the programmability because they were programmed by experts who were supposed to be good at all this data mapping. Okay. Okay. So basically, uh, communications are done via remote function calls. I will show you examples of this. As a result, uh, in each of these Vaults, we also add message queues, so you get messages and you, messages get queued up because there's still some latency associated with it and the in-order core processes these messages uh, based on their arrival order. Uh, and there's also prefetching mechanisms that we will talk about. So this is one example. Basically, uh, this is uh, the compute-centric way of writing PageRank. And if you want to actually do this in Tesseract, you basically need to know which vault uh, W is in and in vault 1 you have the address of W and if you want to uh, re-express this uh, computation in terms of a remote function call it kind of looks like this basically you put this function to the ID of W basically vault 2 you need to know the uh, vault 2 uh, and you basically send this function uh, to vault number 2 and vault number 2 uh, updates the rank of W uh, with the value that's sent to it. That's the idea. Okay? And it can be delayed. Uh, well, there, there's also, of course, uh, some, some synchronization that you need to uh, do because, uh, uh, because you actually generate a lot of these requests to different nodes. The question is when do you actually stop, when do you actually wait for the values to finish, right? Uh, and there's some barrier synchronization that happens that I'm not going to talk about over here to ensure that uh, you, uh, at this point you know that all of these functions are done basically. Right? So there needs to be some communication between the course to ensure that they're done. But this is uh, done in a lot of message passing based systems. If you're, how many of you have done distributed systems programming? Yes? So this sounds familiar to a lot of distributed systems. You send a remote function call to some other machine and that other machine does it and you get an acknowledgement, and once you get some acknowledge, once you get all the acknowledgements, you can proceed after the barrier, basically. So a lot of distributed systems are actually programmed this way. In this case, we're doing a distributed system kind of programming in a single machine, right? A single, even in a single vault, even a single chip, you're, it's, it, we, we treat it as a distributed system. Right? Okay. Okay, there's also some other types of calls, but basically this is, uh, you send the function address and the arguments to the remote core, and the remote core stores the incoming message in the message queue, and uh, yeah, basically there's, there's some protocol. This, this doesn't do justice to it, but you can read the paper for more detail. You can see what's sent over here. That's the function pointer, that's the address of the W that's being operated on, and the value that you want to add. And that's the argument, basically value is the argument, yeah. Okay, so we also add some prefetching mechanism. It, uh, there's a lot more detail on the programming model. It's in the paper, but I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, but we also add some prefetching mechanisms over here because it turns out the simple in-order core has access to a lot of memory bandwidth on top of it. And if you have a simple in-order core, it doesn't really exploit that bandwidth. And we don't want that bandwidth to go to waste. Uh, so uh, we add some prefetching mechanisms so that, that uh, these enable prefetching of the data earlier into the core in anticipation that it's going to be used in the core. We'll later have uh, a lecture on prefetching. In fact, one of your labs will be on prefetching. You'll implement some prefetchers and have, have some fun in terms of how much performance they provide 
it's actually a very fun topic and if you really want to have impact in traditional computer architecture today I think prefetching is a very good way because prefetching really brings the data into the processor before uh, you really need it in a sense you can overcome a lot of the latency impact of uh, data access uh, in this case we have a lot of bandwidth so we do a lot of prefetching also so keep that in mind if you have a lot of bandwidth prefetching can be effective uh, assuming you know what to prefetch so let's take a look at the results over here uh, so uh, at the time this was actually the research was done in 2013 or so it was published in 2015 uh, but at the time we had these sort of systems uh, and the, this is a DDR based system that's the most common system it has uh, basically these 32 out of order cores have uh, about 100 gigabytes per second bandwidth available to them which is not a lot really and that's why we're bandwidth bottlenecked. This hybrid memory cube system, it's a 3D stack memory. It's a state-of-the-art 3D stack memory at that time. And it enables higher bandwidth by changing the interface between the processor and memory at very high power consumption and at high cost. But you can get about 600 gigabytes per second bandwidth, which is 6x higher than this, which is not bad, right? Uh, and we also evaluate this sort of system because uh, you can see these are very powerful cores, but we also look at very simpler cores. And spe especially our system has 512 in-order cores, so we wanted to compare to this system that has equivalent number and type of cores over here. So it's, it has the same bandwidth clearly here, but the core types are different. This is many cores, this is out of order cores. And if you look at Tesseract, it looks like this. Basically, it doesn't look like any of these because the paradigm is different, right? Processing and memory are in one place. In a sense, it's 3D stacked, and these 3D stacks communicate with each other this way. And you can see that this also has 512 in-order cores over here. And the important thing is those cores have low latency access to memory on top of them, but they also have very high amounts of bandwidth. This is the aggregate bandwidth that's available to all those 512 cores. It's 8 terabytes per second. Because you're really exploiting the internal bandwidth in the logic layer. Make sense? So that's the, uh, there are multiple arguments here, the bandwidth as well as low latency that the cores have. Okay, so let's take a look at the results. So these are aggregate results, uh, averaged across five different graph processing algorithms with some inputs. Inputs are always hard because it's all in simulation. None of this is really built uh, because we couldn't actually build it uh, because there, there's no way you could actually uh, use the system, uh, use the 3D stack systems as we envisioned them at that time. Currently, people are actually building something similar, but uh, it's still not easy uh, to build it. Uh, basically, you need, you, need to, you need to have access to the logic layer, and you need, to have, uh, you need to be able to make any change you want to the logic layer. As long as you have that, that's good. But currently, logic layers are not, don't have that sort of flexibility. You need to really manufacture your own 3D stack memory. But we already talked about manufacturing your own 3D stack memory, right? You can, today we cannot even manufacture DRAM very well. We're talking about manufacturing 3D stacking on top of that in ac academia. Uh, okay, but basically if you simulate the system, you find out that you get significant performance improvements. So these are the state-of-the-art systems that are buildable at that time. Tesseract without prefetching buys you about 9x compared to the uh, most common system. And with prefetching, you buy even more performance. This is average across five graph processing algorithms. So this is a lot of performance improvement actually. I don't think this is the best performance improvement that you get. Uh, this is end to end application performance. Uh, it, it turns out actually if you optimize the system you can get more. Later other works improve this work. There actually, there's actually a bunch of publications. One of them is appearing next week in Micro that show that if you actually for example partition your graphs better you can get even more performance improvement. If you actually uh, schedule your computation in a different way than what we did you can actually get a lot more performance improvement. I think people have shown numbers like 80 to 90x uh, compared to our numbers. Uh, so it's good that other people show improve the work. Clearly you can improve the work and get, get much higher numbers. Uh, so the hope is that some, somebody will build the system at some point. But where are the benefits coming from? Essentially you can see that these are, this is the uh, memory bandwidth utilized by the cores. So in the baseline system, you, have, you don't have ample memory bandwidth, so you don't utilize a lot of memory bandwidth. But in Tesseract, you have 8 terabytes per second memory bandwidth exposed to the cores, and now you can use about 2.9 terabytes per second. But I know that this is not actually the best performance improvement that we can get, because 2.9 terabytes per second out of 8 terabytes per second is not very high, right? So we're not utilizing the memory bandwidth extremely efficiently, even though we're doing all of that prefetching. 
clearly something we can do better. Because if you look at the baseline system, that's 80 gigabytes per second out of 104 gigabytes per second. So it's always good to think about the baseline system is actually a lot more efficient in terms of its bandwidth utilization. It's utilizing about 80% of the bandwidth. Here, we're not utilizing even, I guess 2.3 is about 37% of the bandwidth rate. So if you get to 80% of the bandwidth, you can easily get to uh, higher performance improvements. Okay, and the paper has a lot more analysis actually. Uh, you can ask the question, okay, you're doing all of this work to change the programming model, but maybe the benefit is coming from just adding more bandwidth, right? And it turns out that's not the case, so this is actually uh, this is a limited set of the workloads, that's why the numbers are lower. But uh, basically, this is the hybrid memory cube based system. That's a baseline that's reason, uh, that you can build. If you actually magically improve the bandwidth to the cores, but not change your programs, you get about 2.3x performance improvements. This is assuming that you magically have 8 terabytes per second bandwidth. Without, uh, but if you actually change your program on top of that, and do what we described, you get even more performance improvement. You can see that you get about 3x more over here. Right? And you can do a similar study over here. This is, the com this is a system with conventional bandwidth. You keep the conventional bandwidth, but change your program. You see that you get about 3x over here, which is interesting. Right? So part of it is actually coming from changing your uh, program and 3D stacking, having 3D stacking with low latencies, but so part uh, the benefit is not just coming from the bandwidth, clearly, right? And on top of that, if you actually add the bandwidth benefits, you go from 3x to 6.5x. So regardless of however you do the study, some of the benefit is clearly coming from bandwidth, but a bigger chunk of the benefit is actually coming from everything else that we do. Uh, and the paper has some more analysis in terms of the energy breakdown, for example. Okay. And uh, the end result in terms of energy is also very promising. This is about 8x energy reduction in the paper. And we don't even show the uh, baseline out of order cores because we believe they're inefficient uh, in the design. Uh, so if you include them, they'll be even higher over here. But the takeaway is you can reduce the energy significantly. And this is end-to-end -end system energy also. It's not just DRAM energy, memory energy. And later works, as I said, improved upon this. I believe their numbers are maybe 20, 30x in terms of the energy reduction. So it's always good to have later works that optimize the system design, right? Okay, any questions? So this gives you an example of what you can achieve by changing the entire system. But let's take a look at the uh, advantage and disadvantage of this approach. Uh, clearly this is, as far as I know, the first specialized graph processing accelerator using processing in memory. I call it specialized, but the specialized part of it is really in prefetching. I think this is really applicable to any kind of workload. Like machine learning could benefit from this as well because you have simple in-order cores. You can replace the in-order cores with accelerators. And you get large system performance and energy benefits. And it takes advantage of 3D stacking for an important workload in this case. And as I said, it's more general than just graph processing except we didn't evaluate it. But clearly there are disadvantages. Basically, you change a lot in the system to get these benefits. So you need to really redesign the entire system. And actually, the paper is really not enough in explaining all of the things that we've done uh, in, the, uh, in terms of changing the system. Uh, you get a new programming model. You get specialized test rack cores for uh, processing. And also, there's a huge cost associated with it, right? Whenever you redesign the entire system, there's a cost associated with it. All of those interconnects that, we, that you build internally inside the chip, they also lead to cost. So these are all adopt adoption issues, clearly. Change, cost cost is less of an adoption issue, I think, because you really need to bite the bullet if you want to change the, some new technology. But changing a lot in the system it could be a, a limiter in terms of adoption. And I think this is, in the end, you're li really limited by this. Your performance and energy benefits are limited by these off-chip links uh, and or graph partitioning, how well you can localize the computation within a single node. That's true for any distributed system, actually. Whenever you design a distributed system, if you're communicating too much across nodes, then your scalability is limited. You really have to either hide the latency of that communication somehow, but you cannot hide the energy because you're really communicating. Energy cost is always there. Latency is easier to handle in that case if you have a lot of computation and you can hide the latency of that computation, but you have to bear the energy cost. 
But if you can somehow partition your work such that you localize the communication on a single machine or a single node, then you're much more scalable. But later works actually targeted this and uh, they, show, uh, they, they designed mechanisms to do the partitioning much better. And as a result, they, they showed be, uh, much higher performance improvements on top of our work. So I think this is still very promising actually and this is the, the paper. You may see it in your homework. We'll see. Uh, but I would recommend reading it regardless. Okay, any questions? No questions. Any ideas? Is this interesting? Maybe. For some people it is. Maybe you need to think about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like this sort of thinking, I think, because it really pushes the boundaries. And this also pushes the boundaries, but in a very different way. You will see that as we go down, the results will not be as impressive. It's not going to be 13x. I actually, 13x doesn't do justice to it because later we're clearly improved it to 80x or 100x. I don't know what the number is right now. Uh, but this, this could lead to around two orders of magnitude improvements. But once we get there, you will see numbers like 30 to 50 percent. So if you, if you move very little out of the system, uh, if, you if you're able to change very little, the benefits that you get will also be commensurately little. But this is also really important to do because that's a really real adoption issue. And I think systems, uh, like this, this sort of complete change in the system may be adopted by people who are really at the cutting edge. Those are the people who really are building the most cutting edge systems and they're willing to actually change potentially the entire system so that they can lead to the next 100x, let's say. But most of the people who are building computers, they're not at the cutting edge or who are using the computers, they're not at the cutting edge. They're more interested in this one, right? In a sense, because this is low cost and maybe they'll get 30% and they'll be happy with it. Right? That's why this is kind of targeting different kinds of adoption. But if you think about people who are at the cutting edge, that may be less than 1% of the world. Here you're talking about perhaps more than 90% or 99% of the world. So it's good to keep these, these things in perspective. These two things have different kinds of value propositions. But people who are at the cutting edge are interesting because GPUs were at the cutting edge, right? People started, who were at the cutting edge started using GPUs. And GPUs later trickled down and became more general purpose. They're still not as general purpose as they could be because they still face some of the issues like this. But they are much more general purpose than they were like 20 years ago, when first papers were being published on how to use GPUs for non-graphics applications. That was about 20 years ago. Or but the flurry of GPU research started happening in around 2009, 2010 actually, uh, in terms of using GPUs for uh, non-graphics applications. But the early works were really about 20 years ago. Okay. No questions? No ideas? I guess this may be a good time to stop then, since we're almost at the end of the lecture. Am I correct? Right? right. I think so. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> because I always make this mistake, remember? <laughs> but I think today is not a mistake. 1458 is 1458. Okay. Okay. So we'll pick up tomorrow from this. Hopefully we'll finish computation memory. Please come up with questions and ideas. If you have any questions or ideas, I'd be happy to uh, we'd be happy to discuss them here. So see you tomorrow.